<clears throat> All right, good evening. I will now call to order the Mon or Tuesday, April 9, 2024, regular town council meeting. If you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right. Uh, first on the agenda is the approval of the March 18th, 2024 Town Council meeting memoranda. A copy has been posted. Are there questions from councilors? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. I got a first from Councillor Melton, second from Councillor Sampson. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes seven in favor, zero opposed. Up next is the approval of March payroll claims. Are there any questions from councillors? Oh, I would entertain a motion. I move to approve the March payroll claims. Second. I got a first from Councillor Stein, second from Councillor McElderry. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes seven in favor, zero opposed. Up next is the approval of the March or of the April 9th, 2024 claims. Are there any questions from councilors? I had some questions previously answered in email dialogue, but one response that came back was um, about uh, invoicing that is not appearing to be received. And I just, I think, Cindy, I, just to say it now, we can do this later, but I would like to meet with you and just see the process of how we receive invoices. Is it to a specific email? Is it through the mail? Do we have one specific way of doing it so that we can stop having as many, um, I guess there are just some situations where we've had problems with receiving invoices or knowing that they came from the vendor. So I would love to understand more about that. I don't know if you want to just do it outside of the meeting or no. Okay, thank you. We have several different ways that we receive invoices. Could be mail, could be email. Um, uh, you know, just in, you know, so, um, sometimes it might be on our end where we don't receive it. Sometimes it's um, uh, it's on the vendor's end. Um, but you know, it, it does happen. When we realize it happens, then we you know we request copies so we can get it processed. Okay. But um, you know, there's just so many different ways that we we get things, and we do have an AP email address that we ask people to send them. That's to. what I wondered if we had yeah. an accounts payable that mm -hmm. maybe a streamlined way of getting it could help. Yeah, and, and we do still have some vendors, and we, we try to steer them to that email address, but, you know, we still have some vendors that will send them to a specific person, okay. and, and so, you know, they could get missed in that shuffle as well. Okay. Uh, Just but, with mm -hmm. knowing the fraudulent activity that's mm -hmm. very prevalent these days, it just seems like a streamlined, straight way of doing it is maybe something we could somehow force our vendors to be using. Right, right. Some people still like to mail them in. Right, right. And, um, you know, so, but, um, but yeah, generally as a rule, we try to uh, get them to send them via email to the AP email address. Well, what if we had something where when it got mailed in, someone scanned it and then they literally emailed it to that AP email as well, or just the way it could be more mm -hmm. streamlined that it still is traceable that mm -hmm. way. Right. So that's just a thought. We'll take a look but, at it. But thank you. You're welcome. It was just, um, and that was in regards to the Baker Tilly um, 2023 bills that are still coming through. And so my question was, why they, are we in March paying those? And she right. said that they had not. And they, they were late year 2023 as well. Right. So yes. Yes, late. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Any questions on claims? Any other questions on claims? I got a first from Vice President Burke. Second. Second from Councilor Norris. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. <clears throat> Motion passed to seven in favor, zero opposed. Up next on the agenda is to request to speak on an agenda item. Amy, other than the ones that I have here, did you get any more? Um, 
No, I think you have everything there. Okay, so we our request to speak uh, on agenda items is limited to three minutes per person when they come up. Um, because we have uh, 12 total, what I've done is I have, um, we will go through the first five or six or whatever that gets us to the first 15 minutes, and then we'll give the the next 15 minutes. Uh, but that's that's the max. That's historically what we've done. Heather, correct me if I'm wrong. There's precedent for that with various items. Um, so um, <clears throat> what we'll do is, because the majority of them in order here are, well, all of them essentially in order, are in opposition. We'll start with, what will happen is you'll come up here, if you would please state your name, address for the record. Um, I'll start a timer at two minutes. I'll show you, uh, I'll hold up one finger so that you ha know that you have one finger left, or one minute left, and then, uh, <laughs> careful, careful. Stop your fingers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, after that, after that three minutes, um, you'll be asked uh, politely to go back to your seat, and we've got a wonderful officer up here that's gonna help us find your seat if we need to, so. All right, um, first up we have Lynn Jenkins. And I won't start the timer until after you finish your address. Thank you. Um, Lynn Jenkins, 1730 South, 950 East, uh, Zionsville. Was there anything else I was supposed to? That's it. All right. With the town under-resourced, taxpayers want to understand why the town would approve the Bradley Ridge project with so little discussion. The residential portion of this development will not generate enough property taxes to pay for the services required for even schools, much less required fire police and other amenities. The taxes assessed on a million dollar home will not pay the school's annual operating costs for even one student, resulting in a push for higher taxes for the rest of us. Additional expenditures of this development will force onto the town and the taxpayer will be the expenses for widening County Road 950 East. While the developer has agreed to pave it, the road is not ready for the easily four to five times increase in daily traffic with the addition of 40 homes on the road. The road must also be straightened where it now curves as it crosses the small single lane bridge. The bridge itself will need to be rebuilt. Will the taxpayer have to pay for the developer's roads? The town should be aware of several other changes the developer has made. For example, initially the entrance on 950 was to be emergency only, so 950 would not be heavily traveled road. However, at the last minute, he reneged on the emergency only entrance and converted it to a designated open entrance. What about the required perimeter path? This was deleted in the final proposal as well. Because there is limited traffic on a gravel road, it is a popular road for walking and biking. However, the safety of pedestrians and bikers will be reduced without the perimeter path if they must walk on the road with heavy traffic moving at 45 miles or 40 miles an hour. Will the town be liable for any injuries and deaths uh, with, without this path? The developer has changed his agreements and wording on other items after making private commitments to residents, including on wetlands mitigation and tree preservation areas. Even a request to have the pickleball courts kept on the east side for noise reasons, the map in tonight's presentation shows he has returned it back to the west side of the development. Of far greater importance than his reneging on the pickleball agreement is the last minute abandonment of the easement to the town for the Eagle Creek corridor plan. This is more than just a path. Eagle Creek is the town's drinking water and maintenance of the path and the banks for the creek is critical to the health of the waterway. Again, one must wonder about these last minute rejections of agreements. It's challenging with only the limited few minutes that we taxpayers are allowed to discuss, to object, and to share the importance of the significant changes this project will make to the town, its residents, and taxpayers. The development should be denied, delayed until the comprehensive plan, or at least continued so the town council can investigate such irregularities. Thank you. Thank you. I have some handouts. May I give them to you? To Amy, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. 
Up next, we have Faye Snodgrass. Good evening. Good evening. So Faye Snodgrass, 605 Morningside Drive. Perfect. Go begin? ahead. Okay. Well, good evening. I want to start my comments by applauding the town council and Mayor Stern for taking the necessary steps to create a new comprehensive plan. As leaders of our community who are charged with representing our interest and well-being, having a current document to guide your work is critical. Excuse me. There are important points in the current comprehensive plan that are still very relevant. Most residents, including myself, moved to Zionsville because of the excellent school system and our alignment with the town's values and goals. For example, the current plan notes the benefit of residing in a place with a small town atmosphere and green space. The land use goals in the executive summary include encouraging creativity and design of subdivisions to foster and protect open space and green corridors and other natural features and preserving the natural environment as an important asset and unique attribute to Zionsville and Eagle Township and the development, quote, should respect the unique rural and natural character of the area, end quote. While this plan will soon be replaced, what val residents value most about their community is not likely to change. The Brad Ridge development, which will reform a rural wooded area into a housing development, will erode that area's rural character. The reversal of the developer not to provide an easement along Eagle Creek approved in the Parks Department plan since 2013 is problematic, as among other things, it can make it difficult to access Carpenter Nature Reserve. The plan only to preserve a limited amount of trees also runs contrary to our town's longtime vision for growth and negatively impacts wildlife, remembering the animals who had to seek new habitat after the holiday farm development, many of whom were killed by cars. <clears throat> Another concern is the number of large single-family developments impact on our school district since there's strong research that connects the quality of the school system to property values. While prices can vary, Zionsville home tends to be 15% higher than those in nearby communities. The growing enrollment puts a strain on our school system and has led to the construction of new schools, the expansion of the high school, which means significantly higher utility, maintenance, and transportation costs, which are supported by property tax. A severe shortage in quality teachers has already been a challenge for Zionsville. So maintaining the school's blue ribbon designation isn't only good for students, but for all property owners. A recent cost of community service st study that compared the cost of local government services required for every dollar of taxes showed that farmland and open spaces consistently deliver a large net gain to government financial, while residential developments usually drain government budgets. The decision to use 950 as an entrance to this development and Will, or expenses that taxpayers will have to cover. Instead, having developers include open space for recreational use, preservation of wetlands or wooded areas, all of which contribute to quality of life, reduces the burden on the Parks Department, who is charged with developing recreational areas interspersed in residential areas, and again, the use of taxpayer dollars. Thank you, Faye. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, up next, we have Amanda Spurl. Amanda Spurl, 8502 East 200 South, Zionsville, Indiana. Can I go in? After getting to know my neighbors by delivering over 300 signs for SRZ, I can say with confidence they all despise this bud. No one is excited or looking forward to it. However, SRZ is here in support today in exchange for private commitments with the petitioner, which, when you read them, really doesn't seem like much. And considering how much I know my neighbors do not want this bud, it makes you wonder what's going on. Well, let me tell you. They believe our town will not uphold the current zones and ordinances that we have. That a different rezone petition for something much more dense would be easily attainable, such as a zone that would allow townhomes, multifamily, commercial, etc. Regardless of the current comp plan or the new upcoming one. This fear is often connected with the idea that the petitioner will sell off small chunks of the land to make the rezones easier. They believe if challenged, the town will not enforce the Tier 1 zone, nor do anything to make it airtight in the future. They believe our town will never fully implement the two-year-old comp plan that we have, 
leaving gaping holes in our ordinances like with the environmental overlay district and the conservation subdivisions. And lastly, they believe our town will pass amendments to, with minimal scrutiny to the, to the PUD. The power dynamics are out of balance and our citizens are picking the devil they know rather than trusting you and telling you the truth. Need I remind you this is a PUD rezone, a petition that gives the town the most discretion to negotiate a good deal. A PUD is not a right, and this PUD has 86% more houses than the current allowable density, 86%. The petitioner's attorney does a great job of misinterpreting and mis misleading you along the way, but I only get three minutes up here, so I can't counter every single one of his points. Well, I could. Um, but for what? I ask you, um, why are we rolling over and allowing this developer 86% more houses than his right? Is it for the public trail along the creek? Which, by the way, doesn't have a parking lot, so it's realistically inaccessible beyond the, behind the gated community. What, is, um, what else is real value? Is the reason because he has been put through the ringer and has made enough concessions? Well, for starters, that doesn't matter. That's, this is, none of this is personal. The only thing that you should be evaluating is what's in front of you. <clears throat> and before we praise the petitioner for his concessions, realize that the original 410 number was undocumented and a scare tactic, pure and simple. They started with only 341 lots on the map, 308 of those single family homes. So they have literally only dropped a total of 18 single family homes from the beginning of this until now. Is the reason for tax revenue? Do we really know the details on that? What's the difference in revenue to the town if there's 200 bigger houses versus 290 smaller ones? What are the costs to the town services? Have you looked at the numbers for how this will affect school enrollment projections? I have, and I've compared it to current allowable. Thank you, Amanda. I'm good, thanks. <clears throat> okay. Uh, up next, we have Jenny Jenkins. And Dawn Ayers, if you're here, you would be next. And if we end up with enough time, we've got Alma Lothrop. So if you want to line up just in case, we've got four minutes left here. So, Hi, I'm sorry. I'm Jenny Jenkins. My address is 1730 South, 950 East. Um, I live directly across from the proposed development and have lived there for we lived in Zionsville for 39 years and on and off at that property for about 35 years. So it has been uh, part of my front yard in many ways. Um, I, you know, I, I coming a little bit unprepared because, frankly, I have been going back and forth on which of the issues to speak to you about because there are so many issues. Um, I've had so many last minute emails from people concerned about what's happening, concerned and confused about what's going on with this major change to um, Zionsville as a community. So I have notes about Mr. Price's presentation that he's gonna be presenting shortly that I can, as Amanda had said, kind of go through point by point and show that I would disagree and I think many uh, reasonable people would also disagree. I can talk about how uh, this whole development has really loved using the tree canopy preservation provisions and stating things like wildlife preservation corridors and ravine preservation areas and green belt tree preservation areas and how I would really urge you as I've urged many citizens to look closely at that because sometimes a name does not actually describe what it is. There are so many ex um, exceptions included in those zones that are great marketing but they actually don't do anything. Um, I guess I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm also can go through the, you know, there's five points I know in the Indi Indiana code 600 series, which I know all of you are familiar with that as a citizen, I'm just learning about it. Um, but point by point, you know, I can say that the comprehensive plan that, that has absolutely not been considered. There's been a lot of, um, even with the staff for the plan commission, um, you know, they, their, their review of it did not even address that whatsoever. Um, I think another point in that was um, that the town council should pay reasonable regard to the current conditions and character of current structures and uses. Again, where we're talking about is agriculture and residential of large residential lots with home boarding, homes bordering the site. Six acres is the, is the average lot size where this is. The lot sizes for this new PUD are going to be 0.17 to 0.46, so let's say a quarter of an acre. That is not at all. I mean, it just seems to me that if you go through point by point, 
it's very obvious that these things are not being met. Um, so I would just urge you to to take a breather. Hopefully, you know, let listen a little more. Don't just accept that the plan commission's um, approval means that you know it's it's good to go. Because I can tell you just by speaking to to your constituents and many people that there are so many concerns and um, outlying un, unresolved things about this proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, uh, this will be the last one for this 15 minutes, so Don, and we'll have the other uh, side here. So Don, you've got uh, three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Don Ayers, 1575 South 900 East. I'm about a half a mile west of Bradley Ridge. When I moved here almost 30 years ago, I was lured by friends and locals telling me that Zionsville was all about preserving the wonderful, rural, charming town atmosphere. It resembled towns and cities in New England and Maine where the powers that be valued not overdeveloping and overcrowding. I thought we were on the same page with respecting, loving, and preserving hundreds of years old trees, wildlife, and being able to see the stars at night. Apparently, that philosophy has changed. I cannot comprehend why our planning commission and town council is allowing and endorsing these big developers to come here and destroy this beautiful town and convert it into the next South Indianapolis or Carmel. I cannot fathom why we wouldn't want to protect our old growth forests and allow the eagles, the owls, the foxes, the bats, the bees, and countless other species to continue to coexist with us and grace us with their beauty and presence. The only beings that win with the current policies are the developers. They clear cut our land and build as many homes as they can get away with. The policy is start really high knowing the number will be bartered down but actually still be where they wanted it originally. They will make their millions and move on to the next project. Meanwhile, we the people of Zionsville have lost what the town of Zionsville used to be known and loved for. We have also once again disregarded sensitive ecosystems with countless and sometimes even endangered species all in the name of greed. I say it is time for us to stand up and say enough is enough. We don't want to be another Carmel or Indianapolis. We want responsible, low density, controlled development that respects nature and the way of life that draws us to this hidden gem we call Zionsville. When do we say enough is enough? Is it when we are just left with 100 acres of thousands old, or of, of the thousands of old growth forest? Is it when we have driven every eagle, owl, and bat, and songbird out? Is it when the foxes and their kits can no longer <clears throat> den here? Is it when light pollution has drowned out the stars? Is it when our creeks and streams are so disrupted and polluted by runoff we have no fish or frogs. I submit that this is, boy, I thought I could get through that in three minutes. But. <laughs> Thank you, Don. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so up, up next we have um, Tony Rodolfo. Good evening. President, members of the town council, my name is Tony Rodolfo. I'm an attorney for Packman Hewlett. Our uh, offices are located at 1620 West Oak Street uh, here in Zionsville. We've been retained by Save Rural Zionsville, a large group of residents in our community formed for the purpose of monitoring and weighing in on this project. Uh, the group is comprised of more than 325 households of concentration around the project site. Uh, because it is such a large group, uh, and we did not want to waste your time tonight with repetitive uh, statements, I'm here tonight speaking on behalf of the group. Uh, so please do not mistake the quantity of speakers with the substance of our remarks. Um, I can share with you that the group is in favor of the developer's proposed project subject to a set of privately negotiated commitments and the terms of the PUD that are been negotiated. And I think it's important to understand how this agreement uh, and the, those commitments were reached. 
Uh, the proposal you see here before you is the result of hundreds of hours of hard work and professional time, which began nine months ago. The leadership team engaged with the developer, engaged with representatives of the town, including the Parks Department, uh, the planning staff, uh, as well as the Boone County Highway Department. We maintained consistent and frequent communications with our members. We eventually issued a 20-page uh, report covering the outreach efforts, uh, the results of our meetings and our discussions, the project status and commitments in, in terms of the agreement. This work culminated in uh, two meetings with neighbors in February. The first meeting, uh, at these meetings, we had about an hour presentation, talked about the 20-page uh, report, and we gave uh, the neighbors uh, two options. One, finalize the rezoning commitments and an agreement with the developer, or two, to remonstrate. And I can share with you, the first meeting was with the adjoining property owners. Uh, these are residents who are adjacent or indirectly next to the project. While their vote did not carry more weight, we wanted to see what they thought because they're probably most impacted by the project. 89 of those uh, households and attendants voted to finalize the agreement with the developer. Second meeting was opened to all members of Saverill Zionsville. A group included uh, residents from all around the community and 80% of uh, those households uh, voted to finalize the agreement. Um, so you heard today uh, from people that were previously uh, part of the leadership team, um, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the leadership team and, and, and the Saverill Zionsville group. group. While those individuals may disagree with the results of the votes, it is our hope that they would certainly agree with the process uh, and how it was managed. Uh, their voices were amongst many uh, that strengthened our deliberation with the developer and uh, the town. Uh, again, we've reached an agreement with Mr. Inky, uh, Lord of this project. We want to thank the town council and the planning staff for their time and efforts, and we want to thank Mr. Hinky and his team uh, for their willingness to listen and to engage in the negotiated process. Uh, finally, as an aside, I want to take a minute to talk about the leadership team of Save Rural Zionsville. Uh, they represented a large group and a complex issue, and they devoted countless hours. Uh, they attempted to do their best on a very difficult issue. If you see them, I know you probably all have direct communication with them. Please thank them for their work because the community benefits from that work. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to you. Thank you. Hey, Tony, I have one, one question for you. Um, you mentioned there were 80% on that second meeting of all members, but the first meeting you mentioned 89, was it 89% or 89 votes? 89%. Okay, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> okay, up next we have Candace Ulmer. Candace Ulmer, 1880 South, 950 East, Zionsville. Myself and probably two other families are directly impacted by this development. We both live right across from it. And since everybody says there are years, I've been in the Zionsville area 45 years. I've lived in my house at 1880 South, 950 East for 41. Had I known this was gonna be the agenda tonight, I'm remiss, I'd send my third letter uh, in favor of this project. Things are gonna change. I didn't see anybody else come in and buy this land or offer the Bradley girls before it went to a developer uh, to put it in conservation or anything. You didn't see another farmer come in. Our ag area is gonna be developed sooner or later. I think this is one of the best developments for us. Under the current Zoning, I believe, we could have a gravel pit in there. I certainly wouldn't want that across from me. But when you look at, I'm sorry, Holiday Farms, Promontory, Bridgewater, Chatham, uh, up in Westfield, I think this is the best project for us for that area, and I hope you vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, Dennis, or uh, sorry, David and Janice, Agarball, am I saying that right? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. My name is Janice Agarwal, 9906 East 200 South. Three of my borders will be this development. I don't like the confrontation of all this going on. We're all neighbors. Development's gonna happen. Many of us wanted to buy that land. Many of us wanted to buy that land. No one likes the development, but I certainly don't like the development of all the apartments and condos that are going up. If I'm gonna have three neighbors, I'd like those neighbors to be a well-developed 
place. And this is one of the best developments we're going to get. If Steve doesn't take this, what is he going to do? Is he going to sell it to somebody else? And what are they going to do? They're going to come in and they're going to tear down every one of those trees and we won't have a say so. So the truth is, pick your poison. The poison here is we're going to have a beautiful development of someone who's actually been working with the Save Rural Zionsville people. Every time they ask for a meeting, he gives a meeting. He's a developer. Developers develop. We all want it to be safe, but I would rather see a million dollar house right outside my house. I literally, when I run outside, because I have a farm with cows and pigs and horses and chickens, and they're going to complain about me. So one or two houses complaining about me is going to be a whole heck of a lot better than 30 or 40, because they're going to complain about the smells and everything else. But people that have big houses are going to take very well care of them. They're going to care what their lawns like. They're going to care what they're doing. The pollution goes into Eagle Creek. So honestly, I feel like he's done a great job putting something together. Would I like a forest? Absolutely. But that's not what we have. He bought the land. It's his land. And we just have to work with it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. I certainly want to thank everybody for uh, speaking, coming up here. I know that... Uh, it's not easy to do, to stand up in front of your peers, your neighbors, counsel, on the internet. I mean, it's not easy, and I appreciate it, and appreciate the community input. <clears throat> uh, up next on our agenda is the mayor administration update, and we have Mayor Stair with us again this evening. Good evening. Uh, it's good to be here tonight, and uh, especially after a unique event that we had yesterday at Mulberry Fields for the total eclipse. Uh, before I get started here with the report, I just want to say that uh, I think our Parks Department had been working on that for the better part of a year, and it turned out to be a great success. So I want to thank uh, Jared Logsdon, our superintendent, uh, the event planners, Indy Murdoch and Megan Ray, and the rest of the park staff for planning and executing a great event. And I would also be remiss if I didn't mention the police and fire departments who rose to the occasion as well to create a self safe and welcoming environment, uh, both at Mulberry Fields and in Lyons Park where people were gathered in large numbers. Uh, we ended up with visitors from multiple states in Canada. And uh, I wanna thank the chiefs and all of our public safety officers as well for making Zionsville a welcoming place during that event. All right, moving into the uh, report now, uh, the comprehensive planning process. Since the last council meeting, we have circled back with HWC Consulting and solidified our contract with them. So this is how the process will be carried out. This is the, the big picture view. There will be four steering committee meetings, at least three to four subcommittee meetings on topics, including economic development, the comprehensive plan itself, and transportation. Each member of the steering committee will also take a seat on one of the subcommittees. And there will be opportunities for stakeholders and the public to have significant input in this process. There will be at least six public meetings. There will be a number of online surveys and also open houses. We have $450,000 budgeted for this process. The contract calls for 438,000. So we have a little bit of bad built in there for contingency if we need it. Now, the steering committee will be made up of between 25 and 30 people who represent a broad range of skill sets, areas of interest, and also geography of our town. Uh, it will also include three town councilors. The first steering committee meeting is likely to be held in early May, and there will be significant communication surrounding that, and uh, also uh, the public so that everybody has a chance to give their input to that. The next item uh, on the agenda is the South Village. Uh, since the last council meeting, we have a new working draft of the town-led PUD document, which is now before the plan commission. They will consider that at their April 15th meeting coming up. Uh, I have forwarded copies to all of you as well. Also, it is available on the website for anyone in the public to view and make their comments. Uh, we hope to have it before the council for consideration in May. Uh, the next uh, priority item is digitization. I have nothing new to report on that today, but this continues to be something in the forefront of our minds, not only for better management of our records, but also about creating a better and more efficient interaction with our constituents. 
who deserve a more user-friendly experience that is on a par with our peer communities. Uh, we are working on a path to get there. We have uh, several different possibilities, and I can share more details with you on that as we get closer and as the plan comes together. Uh, also, finance. Um, the first quarter of 2024 ended on March 31st, and we have closed the books. And I'm happy to say that we have reconciled all of our accounts. Now, under the reorganization document, I'm compelled to give you a financial status once a year. But as I've said, we're going to do that once a quarter, just to make sure that uh, we're going to a different level of communication here. And we want to give you a status report now on the first quarter of 2024. And Cindy Poor is prepared to do that. Good evening. Um, just a snapshot of our first quarter. Um, a few things to take in mind in the numbers that I'm going to show you is that um, um, payroll funds, health fund, FSA funds, those are all pass-through accounts. So those have been pulled out, the numbers that I've, um, that I've put together for you. Um, also pulled out the golf course, which will be soon uh, be under um, a management company. So I went ahead and pulled that out. And then the, the uh, base for the budget numbers um, used is budget, any additional appropriations we've had to um, for the first quarter, uh, as well as encumbrances that were carried over from 2023. So, Joe, thank you. Actually, you can go ahead and go to the next one. So for revenues, um, we did a comparison of our first quarter 2024 to our first quarter of 2023. Um, the variance that you're seeing there uh, it was basically because of a, a grant that, that came in for the park at approximately 1.1 million. So um, uh, with that being said, we're pretty close to um, being where we were first quarter last year as well. Um, as far as expenses go, um, expenses, you're show, we're showing a little bit more. Joe, if you could move that, thank you. Uh, yep. Um, we're showing a little bit more of the first quarter of 2024. Um, here again, that is uh, due to the spend of some ARPA dollars. Um, so uh, that's, that's the variance on that, and it's showing you that really there's only about a 3% increase over what we spent the first quarter of 2023. Um, but here again, that was due to the ARPA dollars that we've spent so far. Um, uh, the next slide you'll see that um, kind of breaks down the various departments and where we're at, where we were at um, after first quarter, um, and uh, how there, everything um, breaks out the percentage to what was spent for the first quarter. You might have any questions. See, um, sorry, go ahead, Joe. On an apples to apples basis, mm -hmm. on the expense side, you said the ARPA dollars have caused that increase mm -hmm. if but for the ARPA dollars are we pretty much right we're, we're, we're pretty even yes okay. I was yes a little confused but thank you yeah I had that similar question and then Cindy for revenues mm -hmm. you said pretty close but it was what about a million and a half down on a nine on nine million or seven million. Uh, I think it was a difference of um, once you take the 1.1 out I think there was a difference of uh, about 300,000 um, without looking at the slide can you possibly go back to that slide for me, Joe? I appreciate it. Um, one more. There we go. Uh, so if you take the 1.1 million out, um, it's around uh, three, four hundred thousand dollars. That um, the difference. Uh, there was a little bit at, uh, as far as um, uh, in the planning and permits that had come in. But here again, so much of that is seasonal as well with developments. So there, um, there'll be a lot more of that will come in through the second quarter, but not enough to really say we're down. Yeah. Um, so the, 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 park, the uh, parks grant you're referencing was in 2023? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So just to clarify, so timing, you think, is probably the yes. majority of the issue? Okay. Yes. So by we're not way off budget. It's just the timing of when those funds are going to come in. Correct. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. All right, Cindy, thank you. Um, also, 
I promised you the first meeting of every month that we would do an economic development update, and our economic development director, Corey Sharp, is here now with that. Good evening, counselors. I have a few updates for you in regards to what the Redevelopment Commission is working on. We have been heavily involved with the drafting of the South Village planned unit development that is being introduced to the Plan Commission at their next meeting on April 15th. In addition to uh, the planned unit development for South Village, the Commission approved last month the uh, movement forward for an economic impact study for future development in the South Village so that we can understand uh, the number of jobs, the amount of tax income, and the capital input that's being proposed in the, in the 160 acres of South Village. We are also uh, working on an annual report that's due to DLGF on 415. Our financial consultant, Crow, is working on us with that. Uh, they and Cindy Poor will be uploading that to DLGF um, by Monday, 415. Creekside, uh, we have two lots that we are close to uh, an agreement on for a purchase with lots four and five, and those uh, that purchaser is a uh, medical facility that uh, will house about 20,000 square feet for uh, eye surgeries. And uh, they will be coming before the Redevelopment Commission later this month as well. And then finally, Century is a development north of uh, Interactive Academy on Michigan Road. They are going through the process of requesting an economic development area and TIF funds. Their next step is the Plan Commission on 415. They will be before you on May 6th requesting economic development area and TIF funds. The project is a senior living uh, development that's their estimated improvements, about 58.4 million, estimating 65 jobs and 3.5 million on annual payroll. Their request is 3.655 million for TIF funds to go towards Michigan Road improvements, uh, a trail, along Michigan Road, and then stormwater and utilities. I'll have more information on that project once it comes before you on an, on an agenda item. Yes, ma'am. No? OK. Um, how many lots would be left in Creekside if these two come to purchase four and five? What's left? Uh, one, two, three, seven, eight, and nine. And we are uh, speaking with potential buyers for all of those lots. Um, I think I've asked you this before, but I just want to understand if we have the Creekside PUD filling up, why is it being pulled into a South Village PUD? The, currently, the South Village PUD encompasses multiple different areas. It encompasses uh, the Village Business District uh, that covered an economic impact study area. It includes the Dow PUD. Uh, it includes the uh, Cove PUD and uh, Creekside PUD. It also includes an area um, th that is currently known as Taylor Oil. Um, any development that would come through there would um, likely seek a PUD. One of the reasons why we're including Creekside in this plan is to consolidate these PUDs into one project. Uh, so that the administration, the planning department, can look to one document. Another reason is uh, because every project that has come before uh, us to date has required 
uh, an amendment to the PUD. Now, when we do that, um, it has to go through uh, plan commission, town and town council. And that's not we, that's the buyer that has to go, th go through that process. The uh, initial intent around the PUD was structured around primarily headquarters, uh, but larger headquarters. The lots that we have left are smaller and we're looking at more entrepreneurial type businesses rather than uh, large headquarters that have supplementary businesses like a fitness uh, business or a dry cleaner. So the uses that are allowed underneath the current PUD that are uh, um, compatible with the existing sites that we have left are all subordinate uses to a primary large employer. So that's the other reason why we're trying to bring that in. How many total lots are in the Creekside? Uh, there's a total of 15. 15 or 16. Thank you, counselors. Corey, I've got a question. Yeah, I'm, sorry. I was going to say I've got a question too. Okay. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming and giving us updates. I did have a question on the Century TIF that you mentioned, uh, 3.655. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess, proposed spends would be the trail on 421. I know we talked about this. Is that still specified as restricted dollars in there? Is that, I, I know there's been some concern that maybe that's been broadened to not mention a trail. Is that mentioned as a specific trail on 421? It is uh, specific to a trail. Uh, the way that it is structured right now is that the developer uh, would take a portion of their bond monies and dedicate that specifically to the trail by giving that cash to DPW to construct the trail. Uh, and their uh, reasoning for having the public DPW construct the trail is because much of the trail is off of their property. Land acquisition and easements uh, are required and uh, we as the town agent have a better capability of managing that rather than a private property owner. Yeah, I think I support TPW managing the project and the dollars. I just wanted to make sure it was specified that those, that 600 million or whatever it is, would go for the trail. Yes, sir, it is. Okay, thank you. 600 million. Six. 3.6 million. 600 million. It's a long different trail. Number. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a long it's trail. It's a trail to Key West. <laughs> Um, Corey, I was going to ask the, I'm actually flipping through the, um, the South Village PUD here and just going through and looking at, I know it says draft online and, and, and whatnot. Can we go through just real quick the state? So it's going to the Planning Commission next month, correct? Yes. Uh, well, it's going next week. Or next week, sorry. Mm -hmm. 415. At that meeting, we will be introducing it and we will be walking through all of the different chapters. Uh, it will also be a public hearing, so we will be able to receive initial feedback. Then following that, uh, we have asked the Plan Commission to um, host a special meeting the first week of May, so that it can be specifically dedicated towards the South Village PUD. Uh, out of that meeting, the Plan Commission can choose to make a recommendation, and then it would move towards you, or they can choose to continue the conversation at the Plan Commission level. So uh, theoretically, it, uh, it could make it to you in May or June. Uh, for review. In addition to um, the plan commission process, the mayor is hosting South Village chats uh, all across the town. Those chats are available for anyone in the public and they are posted online on our South Village website. It's uh, southvillagezionsville.com. Um, <clears throat> so the Thank you for that. Um, is that also where I see there's there's learn about the project in the news, watch the announcements, frequently asked questions. Um, where can so, for example, 
you know, Councillor Melton had mentioned initial feedback that he's received about five-story buildings. I've received the same feedback, and I know the email that you sent us was keep the feedback coming. Uh, where does that feedback go if this is being presented next week to the Planning Commission? It is um, always the frequently asked questions are always being updated, uh, and we are uh, uploading it there. Uh, in addition, when uh, feedback comes directly to the mayor's office or myself, uh, that correspondence is happening directly via email. I don't know that it's being posted online, but... Um, well, I guess I'm, I'm more concerned about is it being included? Because, like I said, oh. Melton sent an email, and our yes. response was, keep it coming. Yep. But as I look at this, if this is what's going to them next week, it, it did not take that into consideration. No, I'm saving all of our email correspondence, and then it will go into the plan commission uh, uh, packet as a received uh, information. So, so since we so, so since we can't communicate with the plan commission, I guess I guess here's my here's mm -hmm. my dilemma with this, right? I mean, everybody up here has received feedback about five-story buildings, four-story buildings in South Village, and um, how the residents don't want it. And and maybe the answer is you guys are getting something different, um, but I don't want the plan commission to hear this, read this say, gosh, yeah, apparently everybody's in on these five-story buildings down here, send it to us, and then we kick it back to them, and then they send it back to us, and then we kick it back to them, and we go back and forth, and this goes nowhere. Everybody wants South Village to be successful, Yes. right? And we've all talked about this. Everybody wants it to be successful, but it has to be done the right way. Yep. So in regards to the limitation of you as um, uh counselors or any of us being able to speak directly with the plan commission members. Uh, that is an internal policy. My understanding is that that and um, I'm not educated. Heather, I, would, I believe that's. I don't think you can have ex parte communications. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not an expert on that. So go ahead, Councillor Norris, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw the planning commission as a quasi judicial. I, I thought that was just the BZA. Well, there's, so, I, I have, I, I will let somebody else who's a planning zoning lawyer, but we've, we've always had a lot of pushback trying to talk kind of behind the scenes from the plan commission historically. Okay. Well, we understand that um, separation. So um, we have been working diligently uh, to one, save our emails that we've received so that we can incorporate them into a packet. Two, we are corresponding um, through the website with frequently asked questions. And then I guess the third thing is it, um, I have been part of petitions in other communities where counselors are a part of the the neighborhood, and they are speaking at the plan commission meeting uh, because it is a public hearing. Everyone has the right to speak, and I would encourage you as counselors to uh, be a participant in that process at the plan commission meeting so that um, they're hearing uh, directly from you in, in their forum. Is it on the agenda currently? Yes, sir. For, okay. And do you have a date for the special meeting in May that you've already No, ma'am. We uh, have requested that, and that's something that the plan commission will uh, establish. So the president and that board will be the ones that establish the plan, the special meeting. All we have said is that we would like to be at the first part of May. So, yeah, it does seem like if we're getting feedback but this is the same draft that was presented on the website there's been no adjustment to the draft but then that draft is being taken to the plan commission then there is a missing step that feedback can be incorporated to maybe some adjustments to the what the plan commission is going to look at they will see the same document that is on the website right so, so when do changes get made to the PUD? <clears throat> this is a town-led PUD. We've, we've given feedback. When, when, do the, when do those changes happen? 
if we continue to make changes, uh, we can make changes as directed by the plan commission and while these conversations happen. So we have the capability on, on Monday to come before the plan commission and present a document that everyone has seen and then follow up and say, now this has been several weeks since we filed this and we have uh, decided to make these changes and present those changes at that meeting or any time until the plan commission makes a recommendation to you. So uh, we will have the capability to quote unquote redline the document as um, these next couple weeks unfold. Two major things that have come up, like President Plunkett mentioned, was the height. We talked about the height. We talked about it in stories, and then we talked about it in feet. And there's a huge difference that can be, you know, um, there's a variable in between there. But we also talked about um, uh, variances as well with height. And I, I asked that we remove the ability to ha have a variance for the height as well. And I, I just feel like we can tell you these recommendations, but they're not being changed. And there's, you know, um, as we move forward, I think we need to kind of remember that, yes, this is town led along with developers kind of feeding us information, right? Cause these are all development lots owned by developers. Um, and I respect that we want, we want it to pencil, we want it to work. However, you know, I think the feedback we're getting, the biggest feedback is, is, is in height. Uh, whether it's in stories or feet, I don't care, but too tall is too tall. And that's what we've been facing. Um, and I just, I think it's just something that we really need to consider possibly before we push it to the planning commission. We, uh, in regards to your height question in our final draft that was posted on the website and to the plan commission, we did clarify the definition of story uh, and that is in the definition section where we address it um, by use. So if it's a commercial use, then it is 10 feet. And if it's a residential use, then it is eight feet. And that is Please, Councillor Melton, that is from my memory. Yep. So um, don't hold it to me, including you, public. <laughs> um, and then uh, in regards to um, uh, changing the document, we um, have continued to get feedback. We have uh, hired uh, an attorney to help us with this document, and they have... Um, offered up some clarifying language. I did speak with the attorney regarding your question on limiting the capability for a height variance. Um, his initial gut reaction was that is difficult to do uh, because it's um, the public's right to ask for a variance and we can't take that away from them. Um, However, uh, he and I are both brainstorming ways that we can tighten up that language uh, so that uh, the, the BZA understands the intent around um, what we're trying to accomplish with this written document because it is a document that will, will last uh, far beyond this, this administration. So we need to define the intent of what we are trying to achieve so that when the BZA is making decisions, they can read that and then understand how they should make their, their decision. So we are adding that type of language to tighten it up. Hey, Corey, I have one more question. Um, <clears throat> did we get a height from group 1001 from Street View versus the back side? My team did send that to me via email, but I I'm sorry, Councillor Sampson, I don't remember what it is off offhand. I'll okay. follow up with you. Okay, thank you. That would be something I would like to see incorporated. Yep. Yeah, I, I just I do I do think uh, I know I sent an email a while back and and it was I think well received and um, from the administration and sent, included counselors on there. I just I would I would uh, reiterate that. We have a lot of questions and we get a lot of people asking us questions about this. And um, I, I can say unequivocally from my perspective, if the plan commission sees this and approves this, 
I won't vote for it <laughs> because we've got, there's just so much. There's, there's, you know, if you're talking about a 10, 10 foot difference compared to eight foot difference, um, you know, in that mixed use lot, if that's a 10 foot, uh, 10 foot floor in a hotel, we've got a five story hotel down there or a five story uh, surgery center. I mean, then these are what's in the, the permitted uses. And it's like, that's stuff that um, we, we just, we got, we got to get it right, and it would feel good to slow it down, for the record. It would feel really good to slow it down so that we're not, we're not going back and forth, wasting, wasting people's time. So, But I am excited for it, and I do want it to be successful. I will say that. I just want to make sure we Thank get it you, right. Sir. We've got one chance to do this, and this is, a, this is a, I think we've got the right council and the right team and the right administration to, to do it. We've just got to make sure we get it right. Good. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Corey. Um, if I had an attorney here, they would probably tell me to just not talk anymore about this. But I do want to say one thing, that um, the feedback that we've requested from people and the comments that we're getting from people, that's not just an exercise. I, I want you to know that we're hearing those comments. We're hearing the comments about people that don't want five stories there. Uh, but believe it or not, we've gotten comments the other way, too. Uh, so we need to take all that into consideration. And hopefully, by the time it gets to you, we're going to have a plan that, that you can live with, your constituents can live with, and we can all get behind for the benefit of Zionsville. So um, that's all I have to say about that. If you have any other questions about that, I'm not trying to duck anything at any time. I think it's important that we keep the dialogue here going. Uh, continuing on with my uh, updates, um, our new communications manager, Caitlin Watson joined us last week, and she is uh, making her way around uh, the building now. Um, and I would encourage all you to get to know her as well. She has a great professional background, working for both state government and for IU Health. She has a deep well of Zionsville history. She lives in Whitestown. And as you know, uh, I believe that communication is vitally important to everything that we're doing here. Uh, and that begins with being accessible. So Caitlin is going to be accessible to the council and all of our departments, and that's going to begin with her standing up in the back of the room and saying hello to everyone. Um, one of the things I've asked her to do is to make sure that our messaging and our branding is consistent across all of our platforms, and uh, she's already made some great strides in that regard. Uh, the next item that I have on updates uh, is the golf course, um, and we've talked about this a few times in the past. The nicer weather has made it a pretty good place to be. Uh, it looks great. Uh, it's been rainy the last few days, but other than that, the tee sheet has been full. We're off to a very good start. And the new operating agreement that we have for the golf course is now a done deal. Uh, Zionsville residents Pete Proust and Paul Kite will take over management responsibilities through their company, Zionsville National. Uh, they will retain the course manager, Mike Wall, and all key employees. The effective date for this is this week. Uh, Friday, April 12th. That is to coincide with human resources pay periods. Uh, that way the town can transition out and the new operators can transition in more easily. Um, just a couple of the highlights of the deal. There, there have been uh, just minor tweaks since the last time I told you about this, but all current season passes will be honored in full. Uh, there is no change to any course fees in 2024 and only slight changes out of the consumer price index will be permitted in only odd numbered years after that. Uh, all league schedules will remain the same. Both of our middle schools will continue to use the course for practice and matches. Um, summer camp schedule will remain the same. Zionsville National plans to offer increased options in concessions and in the pro shop, as well as upgrading the drainage areas and also the facilities of the course in collaboration with the Parks Board, which can provide matching dollars from the current golf course fund. Uh, I will go before the Parks Board tomorrow night to discuss the agreement with them and to make sure that everybody continues to be on the same page. Any questions about that? Oh, okay, great. Well, and then one final note. Uh, at our last meeting, I did introduce our new town mascot. We call her the Chief Morale Officer, and I'm happy to tell you that she has a name tonight. Uh, we did an unscientific social media poll producing the name Dahlia. She also seems to answer to Dolly. Uh, and she's in the room tonight, too. Uh, needless to say, she has been well received by our town employees and also our town hall guests. And uh, she will continue to perform that vital function of making sure morale is as good as it can be around town hall. She literally looks like a puppet. Uh, 
Yeah. Mayor Sarah, I do have one quick question, and I never know when to interject these because you kind of roll through your update, but this goes all the way back to the steering committees and uh, or the steering committee and the subcommittees for the comprehensive town plan. I know you have solicited names. Yes. I'm just wondering, are you making are you and the deputy mayor making the final decision as to who is on that steering committee? Is there any involvement besides us just nominating folks? There is a group effort. Uh, the uh, planning department, uh, so Mike Dale is in, has been involved in that, as along with uh, Owen Young and uh, Zach, um, Lutz. Zach Lutz. Uh, you know, so it's, it's been a group decision. And also now in conjunction with HWC and their consultant who's okay. running this. So what we, what we sought to do, sought to do was, was have people with a broad uh, range of interests, so making sure that, that interest groups are represented, as well as the geography of the town. Uh, and we think we've come up with a pretty good, um, a pretty good group. Uh, as far as the council's concerned, uh, we've asked the at-large council members to take a seat on the steering committee, as well as Councillor Melton, who's also kind of doubling up because he's running the Pathways Committee too. Uh, and all three of them will be on separate subcommittees, so there'll be a good flow of information back to the council through your council members. Who are, who are on the committee and the subcommittees. So the steering committee is selected. Are the subcommittees all selected at this yes. point? Yes, yes. Okay. The steering, the subcommittees are made up of people on the steering committee. Right. And there is going to be an opportunity for stakeholders to meet too. We've identified some stakeholders that will also have a chance to uh, to weigh in and have, you know, meetings specific to them. Yeah, I might have missed, I didn't realize that everyone had been selected. I just wanted to encourage, just listening to the public comment tonight about Bradley Ridge, um, I think diversity of thought is important, and I just wanted to encourage that as part of the selection criteria is to make sure that we have a full diversity of thought uh, on those steer those subcommittees and the steering committee. We, we've tried as best we can to achieve that, and I hope that in the end that that will be evident in the in the final result when the comprehensive plan is done about a year and a half from now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Stair. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, moving along to town council updates. Are there any updates from councilors? Just a brief update on sure. uh, t tomorrow evening. Just want to make the public aware there is a public meeting being held by NDOT. Uh, upstairs in the Ascension St. Vincent room regarding the 421 forward project, which is the uh, Michigan Road repaving realignment. I don't believe it's a realignment, excuse me. Uh, but they're, they're essentially uh, putting together uh, the initial design criteria for the widening of 421, um, I think just at about 126 uh, and then up north. So encourage everyone, if you can be available uh, to attend that meeting, the more people there to provide your public input about Michigan Road would be appreciated. Thank you. Anything else, counselors? I have something. Um, I have a constituent who would like to donate um, via the town council um, a, a Lucas chest compression device. Um, their family had a life-saving event, and they're so very grateful for the services of our town that this is something they want to do. And since we have a personal connection. They've asked me to make sure I facilitate that. So I don't know. I'm like, chief, chief. I, I, which, okay. So we used to do that through the safety board when we had safety board meetings. Um, chief Van Gorder, would you mind just, what would the process for that be? I mean, I, I remember on the safety board when you guys came in and did the Lucas device presentation and, and then subsequently the request for the council. Yes, those were those were purchased with budgeted funds from the fire department. If we have a uh, individual in the community who's willing to donate that, it would be best if Councillor Sampson and myself can meet with our uh, finance director Cindy Poor and talk about what that proper procedure is. Uh, and we'd be more than happy to meet with them and set that up. And if there's anyone else who wants to open up their checkbook, we would take that one too. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> it's very very kind. Very kind. Those are those are serious devices. <clears throat> So Lucas um, chest compression devices are, if you've ever done CPR, you know how hard it is to keep it going. And I learned this through the Citizens Fire Academy. Um, it's a device that continues on its own. Am I right? I'm describing the right one. Um, so that once the field has been set, they can put that device on the person for transport to the hospital without worrying about um, one of the 
uh, fire people having to keep the chest compressions going. So it's a very <coughs> incredible life-saving um, device. And I believe we only have one. And do we have more than one? Two? We have three? We have three. But obviously we have a very large square uh, mile of uh, our town. And I think this is just amazing that she is recognizing your life-saving and heroic um, event for her, so she wants to pay it back, pay it forward. Thank you. Very cool. Anything else from counselors? All right, moving on. First item of old business, we have a consideration of an ordinance authorizing wild air, or, or authorizing bonds for wild air. This is ordinance 2024-08. Uh, this is a final reading. We have Heather James here from Ice Miller, if needed. Um, counselors, you'll recall, we heard this at the last meeting. This is a final reading. Um, so yeah, any questions for Heather or Heather, if there's anything you'd like to, to share? Um, I guess I would, can you hear me? There we go. Uh, I guess I would just add that this is the final step in the bond process. And the next item on your agenda is the final step and the TIF part of the process. Um, so if you move forward with both of these approvals tonight, then we won't be um, back before you on either the TIF or bond side of things. We're still in the midst of negotiating the project agreement, but otherwise we'll be through all of the necessary statutory approvals for this financing. Any questions for Heather? I know uh, we, Corey, sub, uh, we submitted some questions to you. Is that to be covered later? Okay, sorry. Nope, good. All right, if there are no questions, I will make a motion to uh, introduce or approve, sorry, Ordinance 2024-08 on final reading. Second. Second from Councillor Norris. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes seven in favor, zero opposed. Up next is uh, first item of new business is a consideration of a resolution regarding the establishment of an economic development area. This is the Wild Air EDA Resolution 2024-10. Uh, I would point out to counselors that as a resolution, we would only vote on this one time. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Corey's obviously here. Heather's here. And it looks like uh, Tim and, and uh, some folks from Wild Air. So if there are any questions. <clears throat> I think this is this is what I was asking, Corey. Do you want me to ask the questions, or were they submitted and will they be answered? Oh, okay. So the questions with regard to the uh, sorry. So yes, I did receive your questions, basically about the parameters yes. for the financing. Yes. So those parameters are maximums. Mm -hmm. And so it's a maximum of 25 years. It's a maximum of 8%. Could certainly be lower than either of those. Um, we can't go above that without coming back to the council for additional approvals. Um, so we have to be within those parameters. So it, it sounds like the mayor and the director of finance are authorized to approve any modifications um, of the financial agreement, so within the within the approved parameters. So before you are substantially final versions of the documents. Yes. And so we don't have, for instance, a very a final debt service schedule that lays out the principal and interest payments over the life of the bonds. So anything that's done, even with approval um, by the mayor, still needs to be within the approved parameters that the council's approved. And but that's it. So the council at that point would not have any other checks and balances besides the parameters that have been set. Correct. Okay. Other than if there's anything in the actual project agreement uh, that comes before you that you would like to discuss. Well, I, the, the length of the bond, I know the max is 25 years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that pulls tax dollars away from schools, fire, police. Um, if it can be shorter, I, don't, I, I think that would be something we would want to pursue. Certainly. And I'm just not sure exactly how that would happen. Right. So when we get a little bit closer to a bond sale, then the Crow folks are going to put together f final numbers, and those will have to be within the parameters. But certainly it's the prerogative of everybody on the city side to keep the issuance or the maturity on the bonds as short as possible. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I asked that last meeting. I, I was hoping it would be more like 20. Um, I guess it's still possible. We could restrict it to 20 in this language, but that doesn't give you the flexibility that you're looking for. That's right. Um, if you restrict if you restricted it to 20 years, then that obviously is going to impact the amount of the incentive 
and I'd need the Crow folks to weigh in on how big of an impact that would have, and the developer team to weigh in on how much of an impact that would have on their ability to actually complete the projects. So I, I guess my last question, uh, we didn't quite get to it, was just around the certain infra infrastructure improvements. It's kind of broad language as it relates to the TIF. Uh, I know in the past, commitments have been made, but they weren't necessarily documented, they weren't in writing, and then maybe things changed with the development, the funding wasn't there, and some of the things that maybe we thought were going to happen as a commitment uh, didn't happen. So when do, when do the commitments get finalized in writing so we know exactly what those are? Sure, so we could put more specific language into the bond documents if you'd like. In the project agreement, we're negotiating that specific language and we can carry that over to put the specifics in the trust indenture as well so that bond proceeds can only be drawn down to fund those specific infrastructure improvements and the, the very specific project that we lay out in the documents. Great, thank you. And, mm -hmm. and I had, Corey, I, I had asked about that, Tim, specifically the, the developer agreement, and it's it's in the process of going through the art. Is that I'm, she's shaking her head? I'm going to spell it out for the record. Yes, <laughs> the uh, the RDC will be hearing that developer agreement, I believe, later this month. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I had asked um, Mr. Moffat about um, the EDA um, and TIF being able to. Um, consider the intersection just north of their area. And we had discussions about um, the possibility of assessed value being high enough that it would be able to pay the bond off quicker and that there would be a chance to recoup some of the um, ability to have the TIF funds go towards that additional intersection um, with the hope of the bonds being paid off early. Certainly, so. that's always the hope. So if the bonds are paid off early, then the Redevelopment Commission will have control over those funds and they can then use them on any economic development projects that are in their plan and in serving or benefiting that economic development area. Yeah, that was my one um, concern was the EDA does not include that intersection of 550 and Marysville, but it was explained to me that since it is adjacent, it can use some of the funding. And I'm only stating this because our conversation was very productive and I want the public to know that we are considering the bigger picture when we um, get into some of these conversations, even though we may not talk about it to you. I'd say that those infrastructure improvements are certainly meet the serving and benefiting portion of that test. <clears throat> Are there any other questions for counselors? Again, this is a um, resolution, so it will be read one time and voted on one time. Any other questions? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion. I will make a motion to approve resolution 2024-10. Uh, I will second that. The motion by uh, Councilor Norris, the second by President Plunkett. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes seven in favor, zero opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is a consideration of a rezoning ordinance. This is the Bradley Ridge PUD. This is ordinance 2024-10. Uh, we have Mike Dale, director of planning and building, Matt Price, uh, attorney for Bradley Ridge, available. <clears throat> Good evening, Mike. Good evening. Uh, Mike Dale, uh, director of planning and building, Zionsville. Uh, Hanky Development Group LLC is here this evening to request a rezoning of about 350 acres uh, for the property located at the northwest corner of County Road uh, 200 South and US Highway 421. Uh, this project uh, began with the Planning Commission about July of last year and through a series of kind of starts and false starts and continuances, uh, the Planning Commission ultimately voted on a favorable recommendation, a unanimous favorable recommendation, to rezone that 350 acres to a planned unit development. Uh, the project uh, involves uh, the rezoning of about nine acres uh, for uh, 290 dwelling units. Uh, at this location, there's about 100, out of the 350 acres, about 115 of which is in a floodplain. Um, it's bordered 
uh, not just by US 421 and 200 South, but also by County Road 950 East and 100 South in Union Township. Uh, the project has been reviewed by your TAC committee. Um, there are uh, comment letters associated with those reviews. Uh, the uh, Plan Commission, with its favorable recommendation, also had recommenda uh, recommendations of approval uh, for this project, as you'll see in your packet. Um, also, the developer, uh, Hanke, has submitted uh, zoning commitments uh, to you uh, for this project. And the developer has also worked out a set of private commitments um, between itself and the nearby property owners, to, of which the town is not a party uh, to those commitments. So there are additional commitments above and beyond uh, what was uh, submitted to the town and uh, in, in addition to the conditions of approval recommended by the plan commission. Uh, this project is consistent with the, the airport area strategic land use plan, which is a component of the town's comprehensive plan. So uh, as you may know, the, the, the comprehensive plan was adopted about in 2003 or so, and since then there have been a series of amendments. One of those amendments was the uh, airport overlay uh, that recommends a low density development in this area in particular it says that the intent for this area is to remain low, low density. Estate, low density estate residential with a heavy emphasis on preservation of tree canopy and environmental resources. Low density estate residential should be the predominant land use in this district with minimum lot sizes ranging from two acres without utilities or 0.6 acres per dwelling unit with utilities. Um, within the staff report, you may have seen uh, a table uh, that attempts to calculate what the, the number of dwelling units that could be developed on the site under its current zoning condition. Um, we estimate that, and it's, it's a very rough estimate, but we estimate that under the current zoning, it's possible or maybe possible for the site to be developed with about 156 dwelling units. And again, the uh, developer is requesting uh, 290 uh, dwelling units. Uh, the project would be served by uh, public utilities in particular, particular Hamilton Southeastern Utilities in cooperation with Citizens Water um, and Trico. Uh, so there's uh, kind of a, a belt and um, uh, uh, suspenders approach towards providing utilities to the area. HSC says that they, they have capacity, that they can't provide uh, capacity. Um, however, they do are, are working in cooperation with the other local utilities, namely Citizens and Trico. Um, among the three of them, they are very certain that they can provide uh, utility services to the site. Um, so again, staff's, uh, uh, staff's forwarding the Plan Commission's favorable recommendation. It was a unanimous favorable recommendation to the Town Council subject to uh, resolution of the staff comments referenced in uh, Exhibit A of the report, uh, Implementation of a Traffic Impact Study, a TIS, to the satisfaction of the Department of Public Works, and the uh, revisions to the PUD ordinance pertaining to the Bradley Ridge uh, commitment that speaks to uh, um, uh, when the uh, perimeter uh, trail, perimeter uh, roads would be improved, the Petitioner intends, as I understand, to request a waiver of some of those requirements. Uh, but nonetheless, those should be a requirement within the PUD and, and staff is recommending that and it's referenced in the report. Let's see. Mike, can you back up right there? You said sure. that, um, um, what did you say about the waiver? That the, uh, in order for the, the development to qualify for a waiver of some of the street improvements, they will need to request that from the Planning Commission. Okay. You ready for questions? Yes. Great. You mentioned that the uh, planned unit development, the 290 lots, was consistent with a town recommendation of 156 lots based on current zoning. I'm confused. That does not seem like those numbers are even remotely close to um, what it could be if it was continues to be zoned R1 and agriculture. So could you just help us understand uh, how that decision was reached? Mm -hmm. um, the, the maximum density under the current zoning 
Just that we're talking about zoning. The zoning would allow up to 156 dwelling units. The comprehensive plan, on the other hand, would allow a, higher, a, a larger number of units. How many more? Um, a difference of about uh, 140. So the comprehensive plan actually promotes a, a lot higher density than the current zoning. Does not the discrepancy. And what, what are the calculations for the for that uh, update, the, the amendment, in terms of the agreement that was reached with the airport? The, um, again, in table four of seven in the staff report, um, we gave you a breakdown of how that calculation was arrived at. Um, generally, there's, there's two ways to calculate density. One is called gross density, the other is called maximum density. Both are referenced in our town code. Right. Um, the gross density accounts for the entire land mass, whereas the maximum density is kind of a net, net density when you subtract out floodplain and road improvements, uh, things of that nature. So what I'm referring to you know, verbally to you right now, I'm referring to the maximum density where you net out floodplain and other road improvements. Based on that land area and based on the current zoning, we estimate that the site could be developed with about 156 dwelling units, which is actually below what the comprehensive plan recommends at uh, either uh, uh, 0.6 uh, uh, acres per dwelling unit up to two depending on whether it's utilities or not. Right, so I guess my, yeah. my concern is what we're deciding tonight is whether or not to approve the PUD rezoning. Right. So we have the 156 as it's currently zoned, R1, AG, I know the R2 doesn't really have much yeah. impact. And we're considering a PUD mm -hmm. that would then give the developer the option of putting in up to 290 homes. Right. Um, so that's really the decision here. It's not, it's not whether or not we're talking max or, or gross density, it's, it's 156 to 290. And I think the people that spoke tonight um, in opposition of this have a major concern about that type of density. In my personal opinion, that appears like urban level density in a very rural community. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we are going to spend $450,000 on a comprehensive town plan that hopefully will address these things in the future. But until that time, this will set the precedent for what development looks like in the northern part of Zionsville for many, many years to come, probably exceeding all of our lifetimes. So I, I have a concern with setting that precedent, given the fact that the max density or the allowable buildable acreage would only allow for 156 homes if we chose not to approve this PUD. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as long as we also understand that the, the adopted land use plan for the area actually would support a more density. So to your, what you said there, mm -hmm. uh, Mike, yeah. I think is what, I'm, what I heard. So it's 140, 156, but what you said was the land use plan actually allows up to an additional 140, so 296, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, the, the, the applicant's proposal of 290 is, is within the density allotment, if you will, With the land or allocation for that area. It's, according to the staff report, yeah. it's 269. 269. Yeah. Well, that's gross density. Right, so that's that's the difference. There's two numbers here. Oh my gosh, okay. Right, there's two numbers here. Okay, so the 269 is if you don't net out the floodplain and 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 road improvements. So that's why I'm all, I'm kind of leaning on the other number, the lower number, where you actually the land area does not include floodplain, because realistically that floodplain area is not it's difficult to develop, and so it's going to be a major factor in how many houses they can put on the property. Is the tier one restricted airport area also included in pulling out the unbuildable acreage or it is? I'm seeing Matt nod, yes. Okay. Okay. So Mike, in the you said referencing the airport strategic uh, land use plan that was passed in 2021. Um, and I was here, I voted for it. Um, there's a difference you said that within that specific rezone that's now part of the comp plan, that it would allow up to the 290. Yes. And uh, I guess I'm just struggling with figuring out how that would, uh, how that particular document would allow 290. Is that because you're taking 0.6 Two, acre? 296, it would allow 296. Yeah, it goes up to 296. It goes up to 296. But is that based on 0.6 acre for sewage? Uh, available properties? It would, um, if there's three zoning districts. The R2 zoning district uh, 
consisting of about 15 acres. The number of dwelling units is 1.7 dwelling units per acre. So that's pretty high, 1.7 dwelling units per acre. The R1 zoning district is about one dwelling unit per acre, and that consists of about 155 acres. So it's, it's the sum total of these three different zoning districts. And then the ag district, the third one, it's about one half dwelling unit per acre. So it's, there's kind of a, it's not straightforward. You know, we had to break down the number of dwelling units depending on the zoning district. And then we net out the floodplain. So your point of saying this in, is that the 290 requested homes mm -hmm. is already within the allowable zoning code, the comp plan. Not zoning code. The comp plan. Yes. That was passed three years ago. Yeah, it's within the, the adopted land, land, land use yes. density, if you will, for the area. Which is important. Yeah. It's important for us all to kind of understand that because we're spending $460,000 to do a new comp plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been very complicated. That's why we all have been supportive of it and we need it. But I also, I know it's, it's a guide, right, for future growth and development. But I hope that once that plan is in place, that we really adhere to it. And so it's important that even though this, we say that this plan is out of date, this portion is not exceptionally out of date. It's only three years old. Mm -hmm. And this was something that most, many of us on this uh, up here voted for, uh, or heard it anyway. So it's important that we stay within the framework of what was determined in 2021, just like I hope in, after 2025, we adhere to the new comp plan that we're just about to spend half a million dollars, if that makes sense. Right. So I'm pleased to know that it's within the land use plan mm -hmm. as adopted three years ago. Mike, I've got, um, <clears throat> if you could bear with me here, I know we, have, we heard some stuff in the beginning and we've received, you know, obviously in our packet, other details. I just want to just want to ask for some clarity on um, the petition itself. There are part of the petition shows after the concept plan, which I know Mr. Price is going to likely come up shortly. It says updates to Bradley Ridge PUD um, summary of initial revisions and just to kind of read read through these and then I'm going to read through the next page, which is additional revisions. And I'm going to ask a question about why, why some of these are in here. Reduced number of homes, 410 to 290. Okay, everybody's heard that, right? And consisting of 250 on the east side, 40 on the west side. Remove townhomes from the PUD. Um, addition of over one mile of trail along the west side of Eagle Creek. Remove home sites from Tier 1, prohibiting development of the flight plan, flight plan per the airport area strategic land use study. Uh, limit access locations to one. Uh, off of 421, County Road 200 South and County Road 950 East. Limit pickleball courts to the east side of Eagle Creek and within either an enclosed building or with noise attenuation through tree plantings. And then preserve pine trees along US 41, so the 421. So these are the initial um, summary of initial revisions. When you jump to the additional re revisions to the PUD and new commitments, it says additional tree canopy preservation provisions, Eagle Creek Tree Preservation Area, Ravine Preservation Area, Wildlife Preservation Corridor, Greenbelt Tree Preservation Area. Additional tree plant tree planting requirements through reforestation. Adding provisions requiring downward lighting, revising use uh, table to clarify any restaurant, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, new commitments with Boone County Highway Department pertaining to the perimeter and road improvements. The last one on here, adding private commitments. Um, I understand through the negotiation over the last nine months with um, adjacent landowners, uh, property owners around the, the facility or the, the, in the vicinity itself, that a lot of these additional revisions, new commitments, and even previous revisions were inclusive of their goals and objectives. We hear oftentimes at the town council level, how do we hold the developer to these commitments? Okay. I like seeing these spelled out. My question is adding private commitments. Should that be written into the PUD? Because I don't know what those commitments are, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if somebody comes to me in a year and a half and says, hey, they said they were going to do this. Mm -hmm. I, got, I don't know what those are. Mm -hmm. Now, if the answer is it's a, it's a commitment between the developer, um, 
surrounding own, landowners or, mm -hmm. or whoever it is, and that's a contractual agreement that we can't uphold, but they can come to you and say, Mike, they said they would do this. What's the next step? Then maybe that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But I'm just wondering if yeah. we should have that written into the ordinance or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested yeah. in your thoughts. Yeah. Um, my understanding of those private commitments is that the, the town need not be a party to those commitments, that those would be commitments that, are, uh, that the developer will fulfill in, in relation to those property owners. Now, they're not, they're not secret commitments, obviously, so they can be shared with you. Um, by private doesn't mean they're secret. So if you, want, if you want to see them, I think you may have that in your packet, that those private commitments. If you felt those were important enough to add, if you, if this, if you want the town to enforce those commitments, it's my yeah. It's my understanding yeah. that the, the private commitments, that basically it gives the town the authority to enforce those private commitments. Is that is that my interpretation of the? So Matt, shake, you shaking oh. his head? No. It's in our packet. I've got the private commitments in here. We can add the town to the market if you want. They're, they're private in the sense that they're. Matt, would you mind? I'm sorry. Would you mind just coming up? With so it's Matt Price, uh, attorney for Hinky Development. I wanted to introduce my team, uh, Steve Hinky, Brad Hinky, Doug Fleener, and Suzanne Baker with my office. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here this evening. Uh, yeah, in, over the course of the nine months, those changes that you read were the comments that we received from Sabrell, Zionsville, and other interested parties. And we built those in in a series of revisions over those nine months. It also included a specific set of private, private commitments, which are really uh, not so much in the nature of zoning. They actually go a step beyond that. And this went to specific, for example, uh, specifications for individual homes, uh, the size, for example, the quality, the means of allowing the adjoining property owner to enforce uh, whether we built what we said we were going to build. Uh, as opposed to uh, land use uh, considerations like uh, density, setbacks, uh, open space, things of that nature. And so in, in recent years, we have found it very effective uh, to have private commitments uh, because they are just very, they're, you're allowed to be very uh, creative and uh, uh, work out the specific needs of the adjoiner. Uh, and we did that with counsel for uh, Save Rural Zions bill. Can, can I clarify on paragraph two of the private, these private commitments may be enforced either individually or collectively by the town of Zionsville plan commission, the director of planning for the town of Zionsville, the town and or owners of parcels ground adjoining the Bradley Ridge plan unit development, so on. That's right. Okay. That, that, that's what we've, uh, that's what we provided in paragraph two. Right. I'm sorry if I misunderstood you about, about that. I think, that. well, that was going to be my question. Well, what I was trying to say is I've got two, I've, I've got two sets of commitments. One are the, the commitments we're making to the town, which are also enforceable by the town. And then we've got the private commitments, which are our negotiated agreements with the adjoining property owners, which have that enforceability clause in them. Matt, what's the legal enforcement of these private agreements? If, so, if something were violated and somebody felt like you had violated the agreement, do they have to hire counsel and then they essentially sue the developer? I mean, that would be an option. I mean, I think they could also uh, ask for stop work orders. I mean, if it was certainly the town, it could be a stop work order. They could ask for a review of the uh, building permits or improvement location permits. But it would give them the ability to have some teeth if they saw something occurring out there uh, that was not uh, in compliance with the specific agreements that have been put in place. And this was, this was something that when we were working with Sabrell Zionsville uh, that we made, we specifically stated that on the record that these, these agreements were a part of our petition and a part of the requested approval. And I wanted to clarify something too on density. The, the, the density is not 290, it's 390. We have uh, 200, and you get to that number by you have 234 acres outside of the floodplain. If you take 0.6 units per acre times the 234, that's 390. And so 290, which was the, also a negotiated number with the Sabrell Zionsville organization, the 290 was, was meant to be 
uh, solidly within what the comprehensive plan through the airport study recommended. So we're not out at the edge of what is recommended. We're solidly in the middle of the fairway as far as what that plan is recommending. Does that 390, though, include the uh, acres that's off limit because of the uh, air traffic? Uh, it does. It only accepts out the, uh, the floodplain. But that's one of the things this PUD does is it establishes uh, in 100% in compliance with that airport study that there is not to be uh, improvements made to that tier one zone up in the northwest corner of the project. So it resolves that issue. But it's not 390, right? Because you couldn't, you couldn't build there anyway. You, you could under the existing zoning, yes. Even though it's in the flight? You could, yes. You could, because it's part of the, it's zoned R1. Uh, you could come in today with a plat. And I don't believe the town's position is uh, historically, I, there are reasons why this isn't their position, why this isn't the town's position. Uh, as long as you had a conforming plat, you could build homes within that tier one zone. Because it was zoned R1 before this plan was enacted Correct. in 2021. Correct. Correct. But again, the, the, uh, the airport overlay, like the conference of plan, is advisory or, or a guideline for development. So that doesn't carry the weight of an ordinance. That's why it's possible. To, in a sense, violate the, the plan, yeah. but build into the zone. Yeah, no, thank you for clarifying. So, so Mike, real quick while you're up there, I guess, I guess the other question I had, so I was trying to figure out, should we read, should we write these, memorialize these in the ordinance? Uh, the other question would be, um, since they're not, could the town choose to not enforce them? I, I, I think of an example where um, a neighborhood might say that, you know, we are establishing our rules for our, for our neighborhood where the speed limit is one mile per hour, which may be enforced by the Zionsville Police Department. It doesn't obligate the police department to enforce it, but the the, eight, the, the homeowners in, the, in this example are saying, well, you know, this, if Zionsville wants to enforce that, then they can. Um, I didn't see a signature for the, the town on that commitment, to the, that private commitment. Um, so, again, I think it says it may, you know, may be, direct, may be enforced by the plan director. And typically you wouldn't. The commitment is being made by the property owner, so you wouldn't typically have a counterparty to that. Well, that was, that was going to be my question, right? Is the enforceability of this contract, given that there's no, the, the, not all the parties are signatories to it. So, so in the past, is it your experience that then these still are enforceable? Absolutely, yes, because we've made that part of this approval, and we stipulated that on the record at the request of Sabral Zionsville. Can I, can I just, um, Tony, since you're still here, can you come up real quick? I just, maybe, maybe this will ease my mind a little bit. Um, on, on your way up there, um, you, you mentioned earlier that you were hired as retainer for Save Rules, on retainer for Save Rules Zionsville, right? Or hired as counsel, sorry, for Save Rules Zionsville. So are, are you, you're the one that, um, I guess, as counsel for Save Rural Zionsville, is, is Save Rural Zionsville okay not having these memorialized in this PUD? Yeah, we are comfortable with this. And as uh, Matt indicated, a lot of this deals with quality issues that are not perfect for ordinances or typically are outside of ordinances. Uh, and um, the way I see it, as he indicated, the adjoiners are going to complain to the town. The town will do a st stop work order or not. If the town chooses not to, uh, the adjoiners have rights. They can run into court, seek a declaratory judgment. And we're comfortable how it's set up. Okay. Matt, I, I have a real quick question. You were talking about taking the 234 buildable acres, multiplying it times 0.6 to get the 390. But there's going to be a clubhouse, I'm assuming. There's going to be amenities, roads. So is that really an accurate description of 0.6 acres per lot? You it see is. what I'm saying? It is. I, I, one of the things that, and, and then I'll just, I'll just say this on the record for what it's, uh, for, for all of our kind of, uh, the point of reference we're trying to make is that when, when we speak of densities, we're speaking in terms of gross densities, meaning that we're not trying to back out or pre be predictive of, well, if I take out this uh, footprint for the clubhouse or if I fill part of the floodplain and do compensatory storage on the other part, you know, you can get into a lot of machinations. And so the frame of reference people use in comparing densities is to use a gross density. Uh, certainly the net density may or may not be different depending on, on how we manipulated the property itself, including whether you decided to develop in the floodplain. Uh, we're, we're agreeing that we'll even stipulate to the fact we won't develop in the floodplain, but when you do that, you still wind up with 390 as recommended by the comprehensive plan, not, not 290. So I, I guess here's my concern. Yep. 
and I understand what you're saying. Of course, you can't build a house in a lake. You can't build a house on a creek. You can't build a house on a ravine with a slope of 25%. So it's not feasible yeah. to put houses, if you, using gross density, I think exaggerates what we're talking about. Let me, let me just read from you. I actually looked at the lot map and I, I looked at the exact sizes of each of the lots, color coded it, sent it to all the town councilors. Here's some numbers for the, the, just the community to understand. 50 of the 250 lots on the east side of Bradley Ridge are less than a quarter of acre, actually less than 0.23 acres. 65 more lots are less than 0.32 acres. And 72 more lots on top of that are less than 0.6 acres. Roughly 75% of the homes on the east side of Bradley Ridge don't even get to 0.6 acres. So that's the problem. When you look at a lot map, we can, we can do all kinds of calculations with gross versus max density, but when you actually look at the lots that we are approving and will set the tone for development in North Zionsville, I'm very concerned that we're talking about urban level density. I looked across our town. There are not a whole lot of subdivisions with that type of density outside of the village and a few other subdivisions much closer to, to town. And we know our comprehensive town plan in 2003, it's quite old, but it did state very clearly that intensity and density of any residential development should go down as you get further and further away from the core of our town. True. So this just doesn't fit. And I think that's why a lot of the people that are here and have spoken against it are so concerned. I will tell you this, I'm a Henke fan. I've told him this, I've told his whole family this. I love the work they do. I don't want to run them off. That is not my intention. Um, and I will also say that the west side of this development is beautiful. It's perfect. Estate light lots, just like Mike just mentioned, low density, lots of green space. And then you get to the east side, which I know you've explained that we made decisions on the east based on decisions we made in the west. But my problem with that thought process is you're in essence saying, hey, we did the right thing on the west side. So you need to kind of look the other way and let us do what we want to, want to do on the, on the east side. And that's not consistent with what we need in rural Zionsville. So, again, I, this is nothing against the Henkies. I am not a, I'm not a, against development. I would just love to see these lots bigger. And I would love to see them fit what Mike said right when he walked up to the mic, low-density, estate-like lots. You can't tell me that a lot that is less than a quarter of an acre is an estate lot. It, it, it is. And, I, and I'll tell you why it is, because I think, <laughs> you know, we, okay. were, we were respectful to them and have I been understand. respectful through this process. And, and in fairness to Mr. Hinkey and his team, I, it, he does need to be given due regard for what he's proposed. And what he's proposed is less than one unit an acre. That's the density of this proposal. It's 290 homes on 349 acres. And if it's gonna set precedent, it's gonna set the right precedent for Zionsville. The highest quality homes in Indiana, maybe in the Midwest, certainly around the country, on less than one unit an acre with over a mile of trail, over 30% uh, green space, and providing uh, a home for residents that are gonna support the future of rural Zionsville, including the success of the Carpenter Nature Preserve. This is right down the center of the fairway as far as our comprehensive plan. It sets an extremely high standard, and it's why the diverse community of thought that we engage with with Save Rural Zionsville over the last nine months agreed with us, is that we, we, we achieved their objectives through this thoughtful design. Um, and, and that's why we're here uh, this evening. And, and, and I understand, Sure, the, 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 the western side of the, west, west of Eagle Creek is 40 homes on 150 acres. Right. Uh, it's different on, on the east side. Part of the reason it's different on the east side is because the land is very different. It's open fields predominantly. Now improved through significant discussions with Save Rural Zionsville to include the preservation of wildlife corridors, an Eagle Creek tree preservation area, greenbelt buffers, uh, those are real protections for this property that all work together to set the high standard for this development. And if it sets any precedent, it's a positive one. Uh, you can hold this up and compare any future project against it, and it'll, it will shine and compare favorably. 
have a couple questions, a comment. I have a question for Mike, so bear with me. Um, while you're there, Matt, though, um, earlier on when uh, I can't remember who spoke and asked this question or actually made the, made the claim um, that the entrance on 950 is now going to be a general use, I want you to address that. That the path is being taken away, I want you to address that because I looked over, you shook your head. That that's not true. Can you speak to those two? Yes. And then I'll, I'll go on. Yes. Uh, with regard to County Road 950, our initial uh, plan was to uh, not improve that road and to limit uh, the access off of 950 for emergency access only. And after discussions with Boone County Highway and the town and the town's Department of Public Works, we concluded that that was not a good plan. Uh, for the long range uh, benefit of this area. So we changed our, our plan and what we did is agreed with Boone County Highway on road improvements uh, for all of the perimeter roads, including County Road 950. And we made that a, a general access, a full access to serve those 40 homes on the west side of Eagle Creek. Uh, the other point that I was making with regard to the trail, because I think it's a it's just a misunderstanding of what's going on. The, the, there's a, there was a request from the town at a fairly uh, advanced stage in the discussions to grant an easement along Eagle Creek. So not an easement for the trail. We've already agreed to an easement for the trail. That's in the PUD. But to grant an easement along Eagle Creek, we did not want to do that. And we asked about what was the objective for that. And what we were advised is that that was to allow the town at its cost to provide maintenance uh, within the creek bed itself. And so what we, what we agreed to do is say, look, we're already doing that uh, in other areas in town where we're providing that maintenance. Why don't we not grant the easement, allow us to maintain control over that creek bed, and we'll do the maintenance at our expense and through our homeowners association and not at the town expense. So that's the distinction. It's not, um, and that was agreeable uh, to the town and not something that was, uh, you know, changing anything at the last minute or anything like that. It's just not accurate. It sounds like there's two different easements that people are merging into one. Correct. Yeah. The trail easement is, is, is unchanged. We reached agreement with uh, uh, the parks department, which gave us specifications. We verbatim included their specifications for the trail inside the PUD. Yeah, when I was reading the PUD, um, and I'm sorry for jumping in, Joe, you can, we can go back <laughs> just as soon as I say this. Um, the, I saw that the PUD still said that the back entrance was to be used as um, an emergency services only if Indiana Department of Natural Resources approve a vehicle bridge over Eagle Creek, and if not, then it was an entry. Is that not still true or did i read an old version i think you may be reading an older version okay. of the pd yeah so what we've done now is we, we haven't eliminated that uh, we, we, we one of the things that gave the town concern was tying the access rights to 950 to whether or not a bridge was built mm. and so because what happens if dnr doesn't approve the bridge right and we've got that so so one way of cleaning this up in a way that uh, was more direct, more transparent, and probably better, really, from a long-range planning standpoint with regard to the perimeter road improvements, was to just make those commitments up front to improve County Road 950. And, and we had make, talked and about that. And, and make it an entrance. And make it, if it's going to be improved, make it an entrance for those 40 homes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Joe. Um, I think it was Amanda that brought up also um, that, yeah, there's a trail, but there's nowhere to park. I mean, Overly Warman has that parking lot for the bike trails and the disc golf course and the park and the playground. I don't know if that's something that could be thought about, but you made a good point. It's like, what's the use of a trail if there's nowhere to park to use it? So um, that was just an observation that I had uh, of a very good point. Uh, my question for you, Mike, is if you can, just because a lot of people don't understand what PUDs do and don't do, but speak to, if you would, the... Uh, but for the PUD, the development can have this many homes developed, and with the PUD, this many, just so that it's clear. Okay. Uh, the site is currently zoned. Uh, there's three different zoning districts, agriculture and two different residential zoning districts. Um, if, it were, if not for the PUD, 
under the current zoning, uh, which is we call just a, a straight zoning, um, our calculations, um, if you take out the undeveloped areas and the areas that would be ne need to be dedicated on the perimeter for, for right-of-way improvements, we estimate that the entire site, uh, 350 acres, could be developed with about 156 dwelling units. Okay. And so then the PUD allows for the, the development. Right. Okay. Got yeah. It. And, the, and the, the PUD, the proposed number of dwelling units in this planned unit development ordinance um, is still within or below the, the maximum density allowed by the comprehensive plan. So yeah. another quick question. I sorry, sorry to keep yeah. jumping in, but if if this is a well, hold, hold on a second. Okay. Do you have any other questions? I, I, just, I, just, had, I want to avoid going back and yeah, forth. Yeah, I just okay. had a, I just had a comment. Yeah. It was an, another observation that I had, and and I don't mean any disrespect to you, Tim, or anybody who has already stepped to the microphone. I recognize three minutes goes by like that, but of all the emails that I've received and the time that was taken by members of the community to speak tonight regarding um, this um, project. Nobody brought up density, not one. You, you brought it up, and, and great points. But of all the feedback that I've received, there hasn't been an issue of density that's been brought up to me. Um, but I do appreciate where you're coming from, and that is a, and a good thing to consider as we, as we consider this project going forward. But I just wanted to say that was an observation that I had, and so I'm not saying you're disingenuous or anything like that. And I do know that three minutes goes by quick, so they probably pick their battles. Um, but in the emails that I've gotten, there haven't been anybody that's brought that point up. It's been owls and bats and contamination of water. That's the stuff that I've, I've heard. So just a comment. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, Tim, no, do you I, have something? I think now? Evan was going to. Evan, are you? No, I was just going to ask, were there going to be presentations, or are we going to have some kind of just discussion or? Yeah, Did you, you have anything prepared? prepared? We, can, we can we can certainly do whatever. I, do whatever I feel, like, I feel like this is good dialogue. Yeah, and obviously so there's yeah. there's there's a presentation that we all have access to, and if Mr. Price wants to jump into it, he can. But I think that there's um, this is certainly good dialogue. So yeah, I had um, I had a few questions, and again, I did look at the PowerPoint, so I do have a specific question to that in a minute. But just to Mike's comment about the PUD. Um, it does seem like an odd area for a PUD. Um, I know obviously the rationale being that it allows more, more home sites to go up, as, as he's referenced. But PUDs also traditionally have a lot more of a mixed use, in my opinion, as opposed to just resident. Why, why are you choosing to PUD as opposed to just changing the zoning code residentially to allow what you need it to allow? Because I can tell you, it's a real, it's pretty straightforward, actually, is that the in the airport study picked up on this right away in the rural area is there is not a vehicle under Zionsville zoning ordinance for reducing lot sizes and preserving open space. The main thrust of that comprehensive plan is the reduction of lot sizes in order to preserve the natural features of the property, including the riparian areas, the green space, the floodways. And this allows us to do that. So that, that PUD vehicle is what gives us the flexibility to reduce the lot sizes and convert that into open space. Yeah, that leads into my second question, because you mentioned on here the conservation cluster, and I think we've talked about this. Yep. Um, and it is in the airport plan. That, that's the first time I've, uh, that I became aware of, of this terminology. And it's, I, I knew, I, I, to the point that you're making, I understood. <laughs> Uh, what people were trying to achieve, but this is the terminology for that, right? This is more of a legal uh, zoning. But I guess the challenge is why are we not using that? And I think the answer is because it's in the airport study as an option, but it's not a legal zoning option in right. Zionsville. And maybe that will change. Hopefully in the next couple of years, we could, if once we have a comp plan, we may change zoning and then uh, conservation cluster could be an actual zoning code, and in that case, is that what you would then choose to do? But since it's not really an option, you mention it as a terminology, but you're not formally proposing. A, is that why? That, that's why. Yeah, it's, it doesn't exist in the in the zoning ordinance, so you have to you have to use the PUD vehicle to in, to make that vehicle right. possible. Now, it, it also allows for the mixture of uses that we have. Uh, where we have a clubhouse that has a restaurant for the residents. Uh, 
frankly, it also codifies some of the other things that might be, you might think are intuitively would be permitted in a residential area, but maybe not, like a, a, a campground, a cabin that sells ice cream cones, uh, recreational trails. Uh, like we were talking about South Village earlier, South Village has attempted to incorporate some of those concepts into their uh, terminology too, just because the underlying zoning ordinances just don't envision that mixture of land uses. And that's what the PUD gives you is that creativity and, and ability to blend uses together in a way that creates a community. Yeah, so I love the idea of what the conservation cluster concept does. We probably just need to codify that at some point as an option for zoning in Zionsville, right? Yep. Two other questions. Uh, did I read that there's a, and this has been controversial in other areas, that there would be golf carts allowed on the trail along the creek? There, there would be golf carts permitted uh, for the residents of Bradley Ridge. The plan commission also asked us to make a commitment to provide signage about the rules uh, under Zionsville's uh, golf cart uh, ordinance, which we're doing, which is also uh, something that, for example, Lebanon, Indiana does in areas in their community where they have signage that explains what the rules are for using certain trails. So just for residents? Correct. Well, I mean, why would they need that? Why, why can't they just use the streets? I mean, my, my point being, we, we get requests all the time that people want to open trails uh, and pathways for golf carts. We have a golf course ordinance that allows golf carts on roads for the reason so that we don't want them on trails. This would apply. They would be able to take the golf carts anywhere they want on any road within Berkeley Ridge. Why do they need to be on the trail? It's, it's to use that, that amenity that goes right through the center of where they live. Uh, it will be, it'll be a critical linkage in the future, but initially it's going to be an, an amenity. You know, It's on a, in a public easement, but it'll be an amenity for those residents through an area that has a, lot, a large area of open space. I would have liked to have not seen it in there. Um, obviously, I'm not going to change a vote at this point, but uh, I, I just don't know that it's necessary. But thank you for clarifying that. Is that going to create a conflict, though, with other neighborhoods? I mean, that's my question. I well, I, I think, hold on a second. Do you have any, what else do you have? Um, yeah, just to clarify, so obviously there's the trail along the creek that we that's going to be happening. I think some people were mentioning that maybe they had the understanding that there would also be some kind of pathway along either 950 or 421 that would typically be required that we're not doing. Is that correct? That's not correct. Uh, what the plan commission asked us to change, and staff made this, and it's in the ordinance now, is we had originally proposed not to build a uh, what we think is a kind of a redundant north-south pathway along County Road 950. It is now provided that that will be required unless the plan commission waives that requirement, which, which means it would be like any other development proposal. You're required to do it unless the plan commission would grant a waiver. So, so at this point, you would be putting in a pathway along 950? Correct. That's what I thought. Okay. Just clarifying, because I thought someone mentioned maybe that that they did. didn't take yeah. <clears throat> That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask a question, and we'll lead into yours. So I guess one of the questions I have, Matt, you just mentioned that that will provide an important linkage to the future. <laughs> Can you expand on that? Sure. So right now that trail really doesn't, even if it was built today, doesn't really go anywhere, north or south. Uh, but it does fill in, you know, essentially a mile linkage in the future that would allow uh, a connection to <clears throat> Carpenter to the north and then presumably as uh, future trails are built to the south, extending for, uh, further south and connecting with the existing trail system that uh, we've, we, we've done through our strategic, strategic trails uh, plan that provides for those pathways along Eagle Creek. So I think, I think from, from my perspective, I, I mean, I, I, was, I was looking at this and, and um, I've been very pleased with the dialogue and the communication and listening to stuff and seeing the commitments. And I had initially thought, I think that this sets a very, very dangerous precedent, putting, putting golf carts in a PUD that, that override the town golf cart ordinance because we don't allow golf carts on trails in the town. Um, if the town is responsible for the trail, then this would be the one trail in the entire town of Zionsville that would allow golf carts. Um, and that even listening to the linkage to the future, I don't anticipate, to Brad's point, um, 
you know, we're getting enough pushback just trying to add add the spot just for holiday farms. Um, I can't imagine a scenario where uh, we would want to start looking at allowing golf carts on our walkways uh, and our pathways. Um, I mean, unless, is there somebody back there that? Well, Mr. Mr. Hinky has a oh. lot of experience with golf carts in his communities, and I was just looking over at him. And, yeah. yeah, we, we uh, uh, have golf carts in the community at, at Bridgewater. Uh, same thing with Chatham Hills. We have trails. Uh, we did probably four or five miles of trails in Bridgewater. At that point in time, uh, people were specifying eight-foot wide trails. We made them nine. We're now doing 12 and 15. Uh, and the 20-plus years uh, at Bridgewater, we've never had an accident with a golf cart uh, on, on any of those trails. Um, same thing with Chatham. Uh, we've had no accidents on, on any of the trails with them. Uh, we have had accidents with bicycles uh, with, with pedestrians, but, but not that. And, and uh, uh, also in the Holiday Farms, uh, we did approve, uh, it is approved, and it's part of the PUD for use of golf carts on the trails only within Holiday Farms. Yeah, I, I think the I, I'm not I'm not discounting the use within Holiday Farms. In fact, that's one of the reasons I I led the charge to get the golf cart ordinance in was because of the development. Um, but I think I think the disconnect is when we go off of a private property onto um, town property, town con control property, a sidewalk. Uh, I, I don't. I mean, that was the the biggest pushback I got when I started um, working on that ordinance was we don't want golf carts on the rail trail. We don't want golf carts in places where we can't get emergency vehicles down to to save them if something does happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, ju I just think that's something from from my perspective. I, I can look at it. I can look at it uh, in a silo and say Bradley Ridge wants golf carts. Um, and if, if if our parks director is in favor of, of being able to allow that, and, and the county sheriff is too, and and they can get the appropriate, um, you know service equipment there to, to help folks. I can get behind having it in just one neighborhood, but I think the, uh, I would just say from, from my perspective, I, I'm not in favor of the, the, the linkage to future connectivity. I, mean, I, I understand. Yeah. That was part of the agreement with the Parks Department and the trail. Originally, we were going to have a private trail through the development and it would be a, an exterior public trail. In, in meetings with the neighbors and neighborhood associations and so forth, everybody you know, wanted to see that trail going through, uh, through the middle of the development as a public trail. So we conceded and agreed to make that uh, a public trail. Uh, but it, it also is used for access with homes within the community, kids, not kids, but adults, uh, being able to use that from, uh, to get to the, the clubhouse to get you know, across to the other side. I, I would also point out, Matt, in this, uh, I don't know how this works with with the development. I mean, this being in rural Zionsville, um, it, it wouldn't necessarily fall subject to the Zionsville ordinance. Uh, it would be, you, you'd probably need to make sure you post uh, Boone County uh, regulations associated with that as opposed to Zionsville ordinances. And in that same vein, would it require that age limits, uh, registration of carts, those things would probably not be applied in this scenario. Yes, just like Chatham and Bridgewater, we require registration of the golf carts. We re require annual inspections uh, of the golf carts. We also have uh, standards as to what a golf cart can look like uh, and the main maintenance of it. Uh, we also, uh, uh, if desired by Zionsville, we, the police department will come out, does come out uh, a couple times a year and also inspect the carts uh, to make sure they are in, in compliance. And, and we have a sticker uh, that, that uh, solidifies that. Steve, do you have a, uh, is there an age limit like on our cart? It's yes, yes, you have, you have to have a driver's license. Okay. <clears throat> and Mr. Hehe, you Thank mentioned you. that your paths are pretty wide. Is there any way to make a path have an additional space for golf carts versus the whole of the path? Well, the, the, the paths, we as that? I said, typically in the past, paths were only eight feet. If you go to uh, uh, Peachtree City, you go to places like that where they have eight, 9,000 golf carts, uh, those, those paths were all originally eight feet. They decided to widen them to nine feet. Uh, we went with the nine feet at Bridgewater, and we go with nine and 10 uh, at Chatham. And here, I think we're doing a, a, 12, a 12 foot, which is a really wide, yeah. and wide path. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Councilor Norris? Yeah, I've got a few questions, Matt, on the uh, ordinance really quick, if we can run through that. Sure, yeah. Um, and I'll just reference page numbers. It's just very quick questions on the language. Uh, page 15 talks about the construction of the um, this, this Eagle Creek path. Specifically, it says within two years of construction on the real estate located on the west side of Eagle Creek. Do you, do you know, how do you define start of construction? I mean... I mean it's it's just a little it's a little vague ambiguous. I mean, is that is this part of the fate the the early maybe this is probably a better question. Is this an early phase development, or is this something that's going to come later? Um, the the west side is probably going to come later, uh, and so to, how do we define the start of construction? Basically, we're bringing the excavators out. We're starting to put the streets in, utilities, and so forth, uh, and we usually do that you know in, in a fairly you know good pace because you know, you're spending a lot a lot of money you know, on the infrastructure. So once we would start, and we'd be going through plan commission for development approval for those sections, once we start, uh, you know, shovels in the ground. The, that, the site that improvements? Get, yes, yeah. And more than likely, more than likely, we would probably do it within the two, way within the two years. Uh, generally, we would do something like that, you know, pretty pretty much up front when we're developing that site. Okay, and that was kind of my question. Where, yeah. When does that get phased in? Yeah. Um, Trail, the, the trail easement specifically, is it is it the park's understanding or, or excuse me, let me back up. Uh, what is the understanding as to who's going to maintain this, this one mile trail specifically? Is it going to be parks department via the easement or is, is Hinky Development going to continue to maintain it? The the park, the trails, it's my understanding, is uh, throughout the, the city are, are uh, uh, maintained by the town. They're maintained uh, uh, by the town. <laughs> we, are, we are installing the town. We worked on agreement. We're installing the trail with the town. Uh, under agreement with that. Uh, as a practical matter, uh, we probably end up maintaining those uh, in, in our subdivisions, uh, whether, it's sub, whether it's Bridgewater or, or Chatham, uh, whether it's, you know, sometimes we're doing snow removal, whatever. The town or city generally is not doing that. So we, uh, we do just like, just like uh, snow removal in our streets and our subdivisions, we go ahead and do those ourselves. And on page 20, back to Matt probably, on um, 20, section 14.2A, we just talk about the development plan process. And I guess for my, my edification and maybe the public's edification, can you explain a little bit about the development plan process and when that comes into play um, specifically for this project? I, and, and rough timelines, fine. Yeah, sure. So uh, once uh, uh, Steve is ready to... Uh, develop a portion of this project, he will come in with a plan that will actually lay out uh, the street design, the individual lots, the landscaping treatments, drainage, all of the engineered drawings. And then the plan commission then will have a public hearing on that. And then they will assure at that stage that the terms of this ordinance, the terms of the commitment, are being abided by with with regard to that individual section, and we've typically done that in in phases as we go through um, individual sections over over several years. Okay, thank yep. you. Uh, <clears throat> any other counselors with questions? I do sorry. Um, you mentioned that the reason that you're looking at a PUD rezone versus a residential rezone is because of the conservation subdivision allowing you to be able to put smaller lots in exchange for more green space. Is that relatively accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, can you define for me, uh, I did a lot of reading to try to define what is a conservation subdivision? What qualifies as a conservation subdivision? Um, I think that you could probably get a lot of different interpretations on what a conservation subdivision is. But I think in essence what it is is taking a piece of land and identifying the environmentally sensitive areas on that property and then seeking to preserve those areas uh, through the development proposal's terms. And so I'll give you an example with regard to this property is this property has... Um, uh, old growth uh, forest. It has uh, riparian uh, corridors. Uh, it has a large uh, low area or wetlands area uh, in the southwest corner. Uh, 
it has kind of that, that stand of pine trees along Michigan Road, which is really a big uh, landmark almost in the community. And when you take into kind of account all of those in environmentally sensitive areas, uh, this development proposal seeks to protect uh, those areas through the development uh, process uh, by putting specific restrictions on what can be done uh, to those areas. And so I think that's fundamentally why we believe it, it is a conservation type uh, subdivision very much akin to what was envisioned by the airport study when it, when it you know, saw or identifies uh, uh, properties that have these characteristics along the Michigan Road corridor. So if, so are we talking about any of the 115 acres that are basically not developable, is developable, developable, is that the word? Um, <laughs> no. So, so I guess the reason I ask that is those, that's land that you can't develop anyway, right? It's, it's flood plains, it's creek, it's, you know, again, ravines that you've set aside. So, so taking that away, you came up with 234 acres that can be developed, correct? Yeah, and I, I would, I would, I, I don't, I don't agree with your your statement that you cannot develop in the floodplain. Okay. Uh, the South Village proposal, for example, large sections of the South Village proposal, large sections of Zionsville, okay, are developed and have been developed uh, in the floodway or uh, floodplain. There are rules for how you do that, but it's not correct to say that that area is just by definition undevelopable. That's just not correct. Those areas can be filled. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as long as you meet the rules, which are constantly evolving, even changing in Indiana to become more lenient in 2023, uh, development can occur in those areas. But that is not the plan to, no, no, to no. develop any of that. It's not at all, no. And, and, and even beyond that, we've identified areas outside of floodplain, uh, including the Tier 1 study, which has a, you know, kind of a, transportation economic component to why that is, but it's a substantial burden on this property. Uh, th that area in the Southwest, the ravine areas where we've added additional preservation areas to protect uh, pristine uh, areas on the development. And, and the, Mr. Hinkey's uh, interest in doing that is, is uh, that is his keen interest in doing these developments is that uh, he wants to preserve the natural features of this property as a way of uh, making the development attractive to uh, his customers, as well as being a good environmental steward for the land. Um, that is that is his track record as a developer uh, in central Indiana. My line of questioning goes back to some research I did on this whole concept of conservation subdivisions. Sure. Um, you're right. There were a lot of different interpretations across different municip municipalities across multiple states. But the one thing that I kept finding repeatedly in my research was that conservation subdivisions set aside 50 percent of developable, developable land. Um, and, and by doing such, they argued that they could put smaller lots in, in places you know, throughout the, the rest of the community. If we took 50% away from the 234 developable acres, you're down to 117, if you, if you do that math, times 0. 0.6 is 195 lots. That would be my definition of a conservation subdivision because setting aside land that would be extremely difficult to develop anyway, that's not really a concession. But setting aside land that actually could be developed, like the 71 acres of trees that most likely will have to come down just to put the houses in. I mean, put it in perspective, Starkey Park is 80 acres. So imagine us clear-cutting Starkey Park. That's what's going to have to happen, even with the 72 acres that are being preserved. <clears throat> so that's something that I, I just kind of wanted to put out there in the public space because, and again, Mr. Hinkey, I know you have a, a, a reputation for trying to preserve the environment, but in this case, there's no real effort to preserve the environment outside of what's already going to be very difficult to develop. Does if I may respectfully disagree yeah, sure. uh, with that. Uh, what we are doing, what this development becomes, you always look for something, a centerpiece uh, for that development, something that's really going to make that development different and more unique and better than other developments. You know, holiday farms, the golf course, and so forth. 
But here, you have a great nature area. You have an area that's being farmed and tilled now. You have fertilizers runoff going into Eagle Creek, but all the farming, all through that whole valley, the 100, 140 some odd acres through there. Our goal there is to create a community that is like the communities when, you, when I grew up as a kid. You know, I grew up in a town of 500 people. I was an Eagle Scout. I learned to respect nature. And so what we're doing there is creating the same type thing where kids can go, go through a park, a big area. We'll create this area that's now being farmed. will be planted with grasses. We'll be planted with trees. we plant planted with food plots uh, for wildlife. It will be a, a, a nature area. So, so I, I'll have to disagree with you that we, it's not just taking, just because it's floodplain, we're not leaving it as floodplain. You know, we'll probably create also some wetlands. We're not required to create wetlands, but wetlands become a part of something like that. When I developed uh, uh, the golf course here at Holiday Farms, we were not required uh, to mitigate or put any, any wetlands uh, along the, the trail, uh, the Turkey Foot Trail, but we did. We spent, spent a lot of money. We planted about 32,000 wetland plants in three or four different wetland areas. And so we have many acres. That we have, you know, the eagles are now circling you know, over the golf course there. And so that was something that created beauty, it created beauty along the trail that others can enjoy. And so that's the type of thing that we do to really create a, a nature area. So when we're taking that land. We're not just letting it sit. We're not just letting it you know, farm you know, and continue runoff. We're actually creating uh, a, a, a nature area that with the grasses, trees, and so forth will actually enhance Eagle Creek. Yeah, and I do not disagree on the west side. On the east side, I don't think that that argument holds up. Uh, when you put well, on, 250 on, houses on 120 acres. On the east, on the east side, uh, we are... We, we are entering into, you know, we didn't enter into an agreement to preserve tree canopies, preserve at least, you know, 50 feet beyond uh, Eagle Creek on both sides of it. We also agreed that, that in any of our homes over there, <clears throat> that there is an architectural review committee that will review any tree clearance. So you have to submit your plans, and if we can move a house one direction or another to save a tree, then that has to, has to, be, has to be done before you can even put a shovel, you know, in the ground. We also are requiring more trees to be planted per acre. There's a, there's a substantial amount of the east side that is in open fields. It's being hayed now. Uh, it, was, it was also being used for cattle you know, for a period of time. In those areas, we're requiring substantial tree plantings to go into uh, each, one of, each one of those lots. So when you see our developments you know, three years, five years, seven years down the road, there's far more trees there uh, than, than like in those open fields have now. Okay. And uh, just to address my esteemed colleague, I, I actually think the entire reason Save Rural Zionsville even was founded was around density. I, I remember the first flyer that showed up in my mailbox, and it was all about density. So I do agree that there's environmental issues at play here, but I do think density was a major uh, reason why 320 families signed up. Uh, Councilor Norris had a question. I, I just have a couple of quick clarifications. Um, there's a lot of talk about no construction, what or no construction vehicles whatsoever on 950 East. What, what's the impetus of that? Uh, well, what we've got is uh, 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 th there's construction vehicles only for development on the west side of Eagle Creek. That was an understanding with. Uh, Sabral Zionsville and with the Boone County Highway Department, we've been coordinating that for the future. Okay, and then and then I, I believe there was mention that the pickleball courts were being moved. I, I read East Side, yeah, in the commitments, and then I heard tonight that they were they were being moved to the West Side. No, they're on the East Side. Okay, continue to be on the East Side. That's there's never been any change to that. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's in Exhibit Six. Yeah, right. uh, Councillor Sampson has some questions. All right, and then we'll go um, down to Councillor Melton. I do like um, that we're acknowledging some of the points that were brought up by our speakers um, because I did hear some conflicting information with what I read versus what I heard. So that's when I said, am I reading an old PUD? Um, could you speak on the school district impact? That was one of the issues that was brought up. Yes. Um, so... Um, I'll give you a little bit of a comparison because this goes back to these private commitments. Part of the uh, understanding with Saverill Zionsville with regard to the private commitments was to assure 
that the homes were of uh, an equivalent quality and therefore market value with the homes at Holiday Farm. And to give you an idea, when we uh, got approval for Holiday Farm, we estimated single family homes would be uh, at $875,000 each for the assessed valuation calculation. We estimated uh, that there would be 293 kids. And taking out all the commercial development, all the multifamily development, so only the single family uh, development, uh, it was estimated at that time that Holiday Farms under that, those, uh, that scenario would generate a net positive impact on the school corporation of $1.7 million per year. So let me, let, me, let me tell you how things really worked out at Holiday Farm is that the assessed values are at 1.5 million, not 875,000. And the number of kids uh, came in uh, at, I think it was 140, let me get you an exact number here, at 116 kids with, uh, after the first 242 homes were built. So fewer than uh, 0.5 children per home. And uh, uh, our estimate is that these, uh, these homes will be at least as valuable as, as the homes at uh, Holiday Farm and will have a, an equal positive impact on the school corporation. And we've, and we've been very, very upfront with uh, the school corporation throughout the process if they had any questions. I've personally corresponded with Matt Doublestein about it. And, uh, and I, think, I think they're, I can't speak for them certainly, but I believe they're very comfortable with uh, what they see and what they've witnessed uh, at Holiday. And the required um, perimeter path, you said that unless the plan commission waives it, um, but you've already gone before the plan commission and they did or did not waive it? No, so what the, that, so that, that waiver would be requested, at, if it's requested at all, that would be requested uh, through the development plan process. <clears throat> okay. So you'd have to go back. So uh, that's not the, something yeah. we're dealing with. No, we made, we made that change to affirmatively require the trail along 950, but reserved our right to request a waiver like any other <clears throat> petitioner coming in for a development proposal. And to uh, um, put it out to the public, is it right that the 950 East is being paved by you? Yeah, we've made those, yes. We've made those commitments to the Boone County Highway Department. Their legal counsel has reviewed those commitments. We've talked to the Boone County Highway uh, Engineering Consultant. Uh, and those discussions, as Mr. Rodolfo can uh, attest to, with Saverill Zinesville, it involved uh, Saverill Zinesville, Hinky, and Boone County. We've had multiple conversations with them, and it's been a... Uh, um, a very coordinated process. I'm we just saying that felt like we wound up in a good place since it was an, something that was addressed as a town expense that right. would hit the taxpayer. So I'm just clarifying that. Correct. Um, another question was, um, is there for me? I struggle <laughs> with two things. I've actually, I feel like I've gotten to know you through um, meeting with you, uh, Mr. Hinkey, and I, I've been impressed with your um, communication of your love for this part of the country and this part of Indiana. And I do think you have a great quality product. Um, the two things that I have just kept my eye on um, is I know it started with the possibility of townhomes against Michigan Road, and that was scrapped. But there's a small feeling in my heart that there's still a feel of townhomes, but they're homes now instead of um, more of an apartment living with the small lots. And one of the uh, one of the things I read in the PUD stated that it is and and that combining the platted lots is actually anticipated um, when they're when they go to be sold um, to be developed or to be built on. Um, is there any way which would maybe help with um, Councilor McElderry's concerns? Is there any way to combine some of those preemptively um, and make those lots or, or take away five homes and make each lot a fifth bigger? Um, on those on the smallest ones, I'm not talking about all of them. There, what frequently happens is that people will buy two lots 
and and we'll we'll then replat those. Uh, it happened many times in holiday farms. Happened many times. Uh, so even though there's 290 uh, you know lots there, uh, it's very likely that a number of people will buy will buy two lots. Uh, and even the homes, it, it, it townhomes generally have multi units in in a single building. So you might have. You know, four units, you know, uh, four townhomes, you might have eight, you might have 12, depending on the size of the buildings. These homes, these homes would all be separate, separate homes. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and generally these homes are anywhere from 3,500 to 6,000 square feet. Uh, usually, usually a, a finished lower level, a main level, and the upper level uh, of the homes. Uh, so, so they're, they're, uh, even though they're smaller lots, and, and again, some of these lots, even though they're smaller, they're on lakes, and so so you have a, another large backyard. But if you make the if you reduce or you increase the size of some of those lots, then you decrease the size of some of the lakes. And so that's one of the amenities that we we really try and try and create. Okay, but pointing out that you do yeah. anticipate some of the lots to actually be joined. That was written in the PUD that that has happened to them before, that they anticipate some of the smaller lots to become one instead of two. I thought that was a point worth bringing up. Thank you, yes, it yeah. is. Um, I'm kind of a hard no on the, the golf carts on the path, and I'm trying to wrap my head around how I can get around my feelings because we're in a time where I've already been receiving letters about, um, a post that was made by Jared, uh, the Parks Department, I don't know if you run your social media, but it said, how do we feel as a town about a golf cart path that does go to Holiday Farms? I believe it's Turkey Foot area. I'm not someone who lives in that area and I don't own a golf cart. So um, I can't speak from experience, but I can tell you I've gotten a lot of feedback and that was pulled from a decision um, and and we're looking into some legal uh, who makes the decision um, for that. But there was enough feedback at the time that I feel like I need to say to you, we got to be really careful right here because having golf carts on paths and holiday, it's a golf cart community. I feel like that goes hand in hand with that neighborhood being an exception. <clears throat> You're not a golf cart community in Bradley. So that's probably my biggest struggle. I'm, I'm pretty supportive of the rest of it. And I read everything I could read. But the, the linkage to the future, maybe it's not time yet. Maybe we look at if you're willing to make a wider path and half of it is designated as the golf cart path and the other is not. I could get on board with that. I know you've made a lot of concessions, and I admire that. Um, Save Rural Zionsville was someone I spoke to during my campaign. I, I truly admire us coming together as a community to protect who we are. But I think that's what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to tell you that I think the community doesn't want the first exception made because it just starts the avalanche of what comes next. And maybe we're ready for that in five years. But I have been receiving enough feedback from the community that they're not ready. And that's one part I'm wondering, is there some concession left in you that you can help me with this one stumbling block? Holiday Farms is a golf cart community, is a golf course community. Bradley is a golf cart community. Uh, res we expect residents to go to and from the clubhouse. The clubhouse will be a much smaller clubhouse, but still we'll have an indoor pool. Uh, we'll have an indoor fitness center. Uh, we'll have a, a, an outdoor pool, you know, kids going to and from or whatever. And so it is a golf cart community. Uh, and environmentally, you're not using gas in cars and so forth. Uh, so that's, that's a real plus. So I think that's why it is a golf cart community. It's intended to be, you know, to be that. And you know, if we need to, to add a couple more feet, I mean, we're already 12 feet, I believe, on, on the trail, which is three feet wider than anything we have, let's say, at Chatham or, uh, uh, or, or Bridgewater or Holiday Farm. 
Uh, if, if I need to add a couple feet to that and make it a 14 foot trail, I'll do that. I, I would love it if we could put a dashed line down the middle and, and differentiate. I'll do that too. I also would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't recognize Save Rural Zionsville in their efforts and what they've done. Uh, in my 40 years of development, 42, something like that, uh, I've never dealt with a group more vigorous in all their challenges and what they had. And, and yet we, we came to agreement, conclusion, Christy over here and, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Rodolfo and Bruce uh, all put in so many hours. I would, I would attend meetings with them and they would be so prepared with all this information and everything. And so I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank them or congratulate them uh, for all the work that they put in. <clears throat> All they drove me through. So. Yeah, I, I would agree that, that Zionsville does owe um, a, a thank you to you for stepping up because I think that is something in our community that if if not you, then who? So I think that's great, and I love the dialogue that <clears throat> ha ha yeah. happened between the two of you, and I would love a 14-foot Okay. Pathway with okay. a you dotted line. <laughs> just, just real quick on the 14 foot pathway, and I appreciate the concession here, but I'm looking at Jared. I mean, every time we add more feet to that pathway, we're tearing down more trees along the space that's along the trail. And that's part of the press. So there's a give and take. Yeah. Right, right Jared? I mean, there's going to be, not just for two more feet, you're talking about. I don't know how many more trees, but so. Yeah, I and I'm not fighting golf carts on your roads. I, that's something we've accepted as a community. It's what? just that. I mean, I, I also think that we're, we're the golf cart thing, and believe me, that was a big deal for me, was I think we're setting a dangerous precedent here. And, and then you start working through it. It's nothing we can enforce anyway. It's in the rural places of Zionsville. It doesn't fall subject to the Zionsville golf cart code. I mean, that's the, that's the, the downside to it is... Um, you know, I can hold my nose and vote on this because I don't like the golf cart language in there, but uh, it doesn't matter because it's it's not in not subject and enforceable by our town code anyway because it's in rural Zion. Well, as I by said, in, county. in combined, you know, Chatham, Bridgewater, uh, Holiday Farms, uh, almost 30 years. By the time you combine them, uh, I'm not aware of, a, of any golf cart accidents uh, on our path. <clears throat> but I will widen it. Uh, Councilor Melton, you had a question. Yeah, really, uh, all of our, all my questions really have been answered. And, you know, I do want to just say I applaud uh, preserving land features here in Zionsville. Super important moving forward that that kind of goes in alignment with what we approved uh, during our first our last four years. I will say, um, you know, I know neighborhoods now are, are starting to uh, start to plant native grasses and, and do different plantings like that. Um, and I think that's I think that's the way of our future. And I appreciate you you kind of pushing that agenda with your development um, on the front side of this. And, uh, you know, this last little comment is, you know, because I represent a very rural district and um, it, it's, it's about spot zoning. Uh, changes and requiring utilities from adjacent municipalities. That's not my idea of a, a, a way to develop ground. Um, we've seen this um, out west with the neighboring municipality. Um, we lose control of that land. And once uh, we invite the neighboring utilities to control that, I just ask that Zionsville and this council as we move forward uh, with whether it's this development or any other developments, we consider that heavily as we look at the comprehensive plan. So, uh, but regarding Bradley Ridge here, you know, um, I, I really appreciate that, uh, that conserv conservation. One quick last thing question. In your covenants, is there any kind of rental restriction? Or is that something that, that uh, like something that maybe short-term rentals or I, I'm sure that maybe that's not the, the quality of house that has that, but is there anything? I didn't see it in here. Is there, is that, is that on the radar? You know, uh, I, I can't speak for more broadly whether uh, Hinky includes a rental restriction or not, but uh, the covenants that you see before you were the ones that we worked on together with Save Rural Zionsville. I don't know that Tony and I actually thought about that specific issue when we were putting those together. We do not have rental restrictions, Bridgewater, Chatham, <laughs> or Holiday Farms. 
uh, with the, the, the price of the homes and that type of thing, we generally don't see uh, that type of, of rental. Rental might be ten, twelve thousand dollars a month, so we just we don't see it. We do sometimes see if someone, Lily, for instance, is transferred to Europe for a year or two years, they may rent that house, you know, for that 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 period of time. But uh, uh, you don't see short-term rentals, or you know, we've never had any issues with that. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Councilor Burke, do you have something? Yeah, the only other question that kind of came up uh, that I, I just wanted to kind of unpack a little bit more, which I guess kind of surprised me, but I, I just want to understand it. So <clears throat> this is an, this kind of involves the ecological health of the creek, and, uh, and Jared may be part of answering this as well from the town, but it sounds like what you're saying is that the HOA would take on the cost and responsibility of maintaining the creek through the property, which is somewhat concerning, um, just thinking, you know, maybe that's even better. I don't know. Uh, as opposed to maybe the town who I guess would otherwise maintain that. And this is, this is an important waterway for our town. Um, and I guess I'd be interested in Jared's opinion on why that's a good move to let, and is it even common for an HOA to maintain a significant uh, waterway like that? Thank you, Jared Logsdon, Superintendent of Parks and Recreation here in Zionsville. So as a TAC review member, as I look at new developments that come into our community, I put it through several filters that we really don't have quantifiable standards for. So that's recreation, conservation, quality of life, and connectivity. So with this project, connectivity and conservation were the two biggest things. Connectivity with our regional trail that's been proposed since 2016 and actually beyond that. Um, if you look in the early 90s and or late 90s and early 2000s, you'll also see the idea of conserving the creek and adding a trail along it. So uh, that was a staple we wanted to uphold, and we really did push back. And I will give um, um, compliments to Mr. Hinkey. Uh, we were on very opposite sides of that conversation at nine months ago. So uh, the Parks Department in our staff letters did mention the regional trail and the standards we wanted to see. And there was um, adamant pushback. And through compromise and negotiations, we came to the public trail uh, that would run through the property. So I will give credence there. Um, our original request was for the Eagle Creek Greenway. So um, there actually is two components to that. And that's something that we as a town need to identify in the comp plan process. And if approved by the community and then ultimately approved by our uh, abling bodies, can implement our control ordinances further down. And we can have those standards that I mentioned are just negotiations right now. So we are working with the tools we have today as a parks department to influence the quality of life, recreation, and conservation in Zionsville. And with Eagle Creek being our defining natural feature here in Zionsville, there is exceptional precedence to maintain what we can because not only are we developing an, a regional trail that will be on par with the big four rail trail that we have today that our communities within Eagle Township and others enjoy. But this regional connection um, from a transportation aspect is going to connect to the village um, and our big four rail trail as proposed with the South Village PUD that will be before you in the future, as well as the Midland Trace Trail that already runs through Westfield and our neighboring communities to the east. So as you zoom out that map, these regional trails are actually becoming these corridors for bike tourism, for recreation, as well as for modes of transportation. I think one of our greatest successes of the Big Four Rail Trail was a patron stopping and telling me that he now rides to work on his bike because he has that option. Um, so those are the solutions we're creating with these trails in addition to recreation. And specifically to conservation, as I mentioned, Eagle Creek is our defining um, natural feature in Zionsville, but we don't have any teeth to set those expectations of what should be conserved. So our original request was 50 feet on each side of the bank that would be deeded uh, or an easement conveyed to the park board so that could be controlled in perpetuity. And the reason that is so important is because as we look today, we already have seven parks along Eagle Creek. We have segments of trail that go beyond that, including what is beyond the Turkey Foot Trail. And our ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is to create that corridor from the village all the way to Carpenter Nature Preserve. And not only just that corridor, but 
maintaining the quality of the uh, species that live within that, addressing erosion concerns, and ultimately having a viable natural habitat that not only serves our residents, but also serves our drinking water and the species that call Zionsville home today. So I think it is imperative that we do look at that with quite the scrutinizing magnifying glass. So our request was for an easement to the park board so that in the longevity and the perpetuity of Eagle Creek, we could have control over maintaining those standards. The concession and the compromise we made would be that that responsibility would to fall to the HOA. And I do have several concerns about that with the resources they may have, um, which I was told were, are probably larger than what our park system has right now. But um, that could be uh, argued or um, disputed. But ultimately, the requirements that are before you are that the HOA would um, combat invasive species as identified by the Indiana, Indiana Department of uh, Natural Resources. They would promote biodiversity and the restoration of natural plantings within those spaces. And they would address egregious erosion, which are all three things that we would do as a park system. So ultimately, whether we are behind the wheel or this HOA is, um, would be up to this body as well as our agreements um, as this moves forward. Uh, as I do mention, I do have concerns about the longevity of that and that monumental task put upon that voluntary board that doesn't exist yet. So you asked for the, the easement, and instead they, the, the, the compromise was that the HOA will manage this process. Um, I guess, Matt, I'd be curious why, why you thought that was a good idea. And I, I guess just because knowing the expertise that our Parks Department brings to this topic, I don't know that people on an HOA have any, any common knowledge of uh, ecology. Yeah, I can. Yeah, uh, Jared and I had extensive discussions uh, uh, on that. We, we as a developer will be maintaining this for, for a number of years. Uh, we generally don't turn this over to the HOA. Uh, for instance, Holiday Farms, we're still, we're still at Chatham Hills, we're still, uh, has not been turned over to the HOA because we as a developer, want to make sure everything is great. In Holiday Farms, uh, we did exactly what Jared was suggesting. We, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars going the entire length of Eagle Creek on our side, it, removing, working with DNR, removing all the invasive, uh, invasive species. We will do the same thing here. There's a lot of invasive species along Eagle Creek on both sides. With the 50 feet on, on each side, it's only a maintenance easement and so we, as a developer, will be doing, you know, we'll be doing that and cleaning that out. So it's an expense the town won't have. If it is, and we want to make sure that these invasive species are removed. That it's as beautiful as possible for our residents, but also the people using the using the trail. So it's important for us, you know, to, to go ahead and do that and, and, and occupy that, and then turning it over to the HOA. In the in the documents, it does provide that at some point in time, if the HOA does not maintain it, the HOA can. I, has an option to transfer that to the town. What's the benefit to you? I mean, why do you want to have control over it as opposed to giving it to the Parks Department, which seems like that's their area of expertise, given this, given the significance of the creek? Well, I, I think I think what we're what <coughs> our concern is, is 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 that the amount of money it's going to take to do it up front, the several hundred thousand dollars or more, uh, because there are some log jams in the in the creek. When we did holiday farms, there were log jams in the creek. We contacted the, 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 the town, we contacted the county, we contacted DNR. Nobody would move it. Nobody would come out to spend money to do it. So we hired excavators to remove the log jams because it was creating flooding, not only on our property, but other properties uh, uh, upstream you know, from it. So uh, we want to make sure that it's done well and done right up front. And, and we'll, we'll gladly consult with Jared on, on what goes in, I think we've already indicated indicated that, but but we're willing to spend our money doing that uh, as part of the development. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions from counselors? Just a comment in closing, I guess. Um, and you guys heard it. I just think it's important to reflect on it. Eighty nine percent of the contiguous homeowners voted in favor of the project. Eighty percent of the 325 members of Save Rural voted in favor. Hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no, we're not going to do this. This is all, this has already been presented. 
This has already been presented. The what, what was stated earlier, what was stated earlier was that eight out of nine contiguous property owners voted in favor of the property, and then that the remaining 30, uh, 31 voted in favor and eight voted in opposition on the other side. So it was like 38 to eight, okay? Yeah, that was stated at the very beginning. Tony, is that, that's what you stated at the beginning, correct? Okay, so he's, the numbers, the numbers are correct and the percentage, yeah, okay, yes, so those, so the, sorry for the, sorry for the confusion there, but that, that was, yeah. I see what you're saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's All right, it. Yeah. go ahead, Joe. That was it, 89%, and then of the people that voted, of the people that voted, 80%, fair? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would, I would just say, I mean, I've heard this said a lot tonight, a lot in this process, um, that, you know, PUDs. PUDs um, are are the way for the town to be the most restrictive in types of developments and and to control as much as possible. And um, I mean, this is why we have this particular process. It allows us to have the most um, uh, enforceable um, oversight. Uh, it gets commitments from developers, commitments from other folks. Um, and and I think that from my perspective, just to to share. Um, to the community, I, I mean, I think from my perspective, if this PUD wasn't proposed, obviously I feel like we would be left up with current zoning. And some folks may feel comfortable with that, some folks may not. Um, I appreciate the work that Sabre Rose Zionsville did, uh, their board, the committees, the folks that were a part of it before, the, part, the folks that are still part of it, uh, even the folks that aren't a part of it anymore. Um, I think this is really a, a, an incredible moment. In my eight years on the council, I've never had a group take a developer um, to the table and literally amend a proposal the way that this has happened. Um, and, and I think that's something that both sides should be really proud of. I will say I'm a little saddened. I've heard things, um, I've heard phrases tonight like the devil you know versus the devil you don't or pick your poison. Um, I wrote, I wrote in an op-ed last year, I view these things significantly different. In my opinion, nothing is good or bad until compared to the alternative. And what, what I would say is there are a couple of alternatives. Alternative number one is somebody buys this property and nobody ever does anything to it, right? That's certainly an alternative. And I would say in that scenario, for many, this proposal would not look very good, right? This would be a bad proposal. I think another alternative is Mr. Is Mr. Hinkey decides to walk away from this deal and sells his property to anybody, right? Maybe he sells it to you and you go out and find somebody to come build just within the frameworks and the parameters of what's available. Um, I think this development might look pretty good in that scenario. Uh, I would also say that another alternative is to um, have a developer that has a history of developing projects like Holiday Farms in our community, uh, promontory, desirable communities that people are not trying to leave, that people are trying to get into as aggressively as possible. Um, I think in that scenario, that looks like a pretty good alternative to me. Um, I think developers, I use that in air quotes because we all heard stuff on the campaign trail. Developers generally get somewhat of a bad rap around here, and some of that may be justified. Um, but I hate, I hate to hear phrases like we heard tonight um, to a developer that's brought about a project from a developer that's brought Holiday Farms, Promontory, again, where people want to be in here. I, this, I've, in eight years on the council, I've never had a developer stand here for two hours and take questions and answer questions and be able to do what they did. And um, I appreciate that. Uh, I just, I think we, I think, I think we've got to, we've got to understand what we are and aren't fighting for and understand what we are and aren't approving. And I think, you know, we, we are, uh, we're good, we're a good community. And I think we can, we can just, we can do better than that sometimes. So <clears throat> just my two cents. Um, any other questions from counselors for Mr. Dale, Mr. Price, Mr. Hinky, any of their team, any other communication from counselors? I would remind council that this is um, an ordinance that was submitted to us with a favorable recommendation from the plan commission, which counts as our first reading, which means this is a one reading ordinance. Um, so I would certainly open again, any questions? If there are no questions, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 2024-10. Second. I have a first from Councilor Norris, second from Councilor Sampson. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion passes six in favor, one opposed. Are there any other matters from councilors? No, just the, the other reminder about tomorrow night, 421, uh, 421 forward meeting. Please be there, 7 p.m. Uh, thanks again for everybody that participated tonight. Uh, at this point, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. A second from Vice President Burke. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes seven in favor, zero opposed. The next regular town council meeting is scheduled for Monday, April 15th, 2024 at 7.30 a.m. in the Zionsville Town Hall Council Chambers. The final notice will be posted in compliance with the Indiana Open Door Law. Thank you.